Three, two, one, go. Mr. Dondarian, the winner, correctly predicted the 3.09 start time. Folks, welcome to Starry Wisdom Sunday. Is this thing on? Tap, tap, tap. Looks like it. Friends, if you're watching this video, this is a great one, especially if you're new to the channel. And we've Friends, got a... If you're watching this video. This is a great, yes, yeah, a great a example of what we do here. Absolutely. Um, nah, for real though. One of the most common comments that I get on my channel when people first find it is, do you, do you really, do you really think George Martin is putting this much thought into all this stuff? And, you know, how do you know, right? And it's a very reasonable thing, especially when you first come across my claptrap. Like, what, 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 dude, what are you talking about? You know, the, the joke now is the whole weirward net. Oh, he's always talking about the weirward net. So this stream will be a great um, example of how we know what George is doing. Okay, we're going to talk about a book called Finnegan's Wake in a minute. It's possibly the most complicated book ever written in the English language. It's definitely up there with like, I don't know. I was, I mean, it's, it's complicated. It's, com it's like Bible level complicated. <laughs> It's a song of ice and fire level complicated. And George is using, uh, he's using cer certain ideas and themes from this book. It's, it's, it's a very, very fun and interesting. But so the Tully's, basically the Tully's, this will be a great example. We're going to start real simple and we're going to walk you into the complex symbolism that's going on with ice and fire. And uh, yeah, it's going to just sort of show, it'd be a good insight into George's writing technique and why he's talking about the damn weirwood net so much. And uh, is the chat frozen already? Oh, no, we can fix that. Must have had a weird start. There we go. Those damn kids. Chats, thanks, guys. Thanks for keeping me, uh, keeping me up to date there. Sometimes the chat hangs. So, yes, first of all, this amazing artwork that was partially the inspiration to do this stream. So amazing. Uh, it is by, let me just pull up the name of this fella. It's Lord Hoster Tully's Last Voyage by not a fella, Svets... uh, well, Svetoslav, I guess it is a fella, Svetoslav Petrov. There you go. So, incredible, Svetoslav Petrov, Hoster Tully's Last Voyage, and uh, I'll show you the full version here, actually, since I have cropped it a bit. So that's... That's what it looks like there. It's on the boat. It is a Viking funeral. We are going to read that scene. We're going to read a few scenes today. I've, I've clipped a lot of the best Tully scenes out uh, to read through. But the idea is that we're going to, it's going to be a symbolism. Just a mute left and we've got bingo. Yeah, hang on. It'll, it'll be there sooner or later. Thank you, Mr. Lassimal. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> we're going to do mostly symbolism today. Uh, not a not a character stream. I do kind of want to do. Well, we've got a couple of Tully related character streams coming. Definitely a Sansa Littlefinger stream, which is going to touch on a lot of the backstory of Cat and Lysa. And uh, I think I want to do a Cat and Lysa, Arya Sansa symbolism stream because there's a Nissa Nissa Night King duality with them that's going on. But uh, let's see here. Where do I want to start? There's just so much good stuff. I was up all night last night and the night before doing this. I'm pretty pumped up for this stream, to be honest. You might think House Tully. Fairly innocuous, tame house in the Riverlands. The word Tully means peaceful, like a river. Um, that is in English, I believe. In Don't quote me on this. In, in, in uh, Gaelic, I believe it, it means hill. It definitely means hill in a different language. And... It's funny because I swear half the names in A Song of Ice and Fire translate to hill somehow. <laughs> Which, of course, there's sacred hills everywhere, so that's kind of a big thing. Uh, the name Brendan is a really interesting one. Brendan Tully is, is a great name, it turns out. So, Brendan, just skipping ahead here. Bryn is Welsh for hill, and of course a den is a home in a cave. So Brendan means hill cave, okay? 
But the whole name together, the old Irish form of it is Brianin. Probably not pronouncing that right, but it means prince, and particularly the brave and noble sort of prince. Let me move my little preview window so you can see the rest of the sentence. So, interesting. Brendan Brandon, same name, first of all. So, Brandon Stark and Brendan Rivers, a.k.a. Blood Raven, both have the same name. Both, the name means prince. They are both princes. And in fact, Bran is called Prince a lot in the book, probably more than any other character. He's the Prince of the Greenwood. He's the Prince in Winterfell. He's all this stuff. And then, of course, Blood Raven is a prince as well uh, once he's elevated uh, to uh, the, you know, the taint of bastardy is washed off, whatever. He's, he's actually a lord too. So a couple of princes, and they're living in a cave home in a hill. So it's pretty awesome. The names, and then of course, Brendan Rivers, you know, so it's like uh, a cave home in a hill with rivers, and there's obviously a river down in Blood Raven's cave, and he's talking about the River of Time, which we're going to talk about quite a bit today, because the Tully River symbolism has a lot to do with the River of Time, hence the Finnegan's Wake coming up. Now, since Tully can mean hill, Brendan Tully means a uh, cave home in a hill hill <laughs> or something like that so george loves his hill names like i said they're everywhere they're all named after hills i'm gonna have to i'm gonna start making a count of how many people are named after because Wint fell means hill so winterfell is winter hill jenny of old stones thank you gifting out memberships that's dope House in a cave in a hill and a mountain in a hill. Exactly. I get the idea, George. We're living in hills. We live under, we're mole people. We get it. Oh, Ludmila with a very generous PayPal, which, by the way, if you want to support the program directly, that's the PayPal link below, and I appreciate that. Was just watching the Cold Hand stream when this Tully stream began. Have you moved yet? No. Uh, the move is put back a little bit because I need to prioritize getting a new computer because I'm slow and... The reason why the Ironborn video isn't out is because my computer has officially hit its outdated shelf life. And it is pinwheeling when I try to drag around the massive bars of video. And so uh, I'll be getting a new computer tomorrow when I get paid. So the moving fund became the computer fund. And then I'll be, I'm still looking for a place, but that'll probably be in a month or two. So there's a brief life update. Uh, Bilbo Underhill. Yeah, the Underhill... It, I, was, I was thinking of that with all the hill names. I was thinking about how Bilbo uses the name Underhill when he goes out in disguise. So the basics. Let's do the basics here of these Tullys. They are, there's basically two lines of symbolism for the Tullys. And by the way, this is, we did also do a symbolism of Stoneheart stream. So that'll be a companion to this. We're not going to do a ton of Stoneheart today because we did like a three-hour Stoneheart stream. It did really well. It was a very popular stream. So check that out. Do a lot of Blackfish today. It's a lot of Blackfish coming and general Tully stuff. So the two main things about the Tullys is that they are fishy rivermen and they are mediators of the rivers of the river of time, which is going to be weird with that stuff, right? So they're rivermen because they live on a river, they dress like fish people, their armor has like a fish head and fish scales and all that stuff. Um, their sigil is a fish, and they, uh, their colors, the red and blue, it's specifically, it's a mud red, so it's the reddish brown of the river mud, which of course is, that's the good mud, that's the, <laughs> that's the life-giving mud, and then, um, and there's, there's mythology about people coming from mud and stuff like that. The mud men. George is riffing on that with the Krenog men and Quentin and stuff like that. So I, there is a mud man thing. It's just like, you know, God creating man from the earth, the bones of the earth, that kind of stuff. Um, and then the blue is, of course, the blue of the river. So their colors are the river colors, the river mud and the river water. Yeah, that's that clay mud. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. Lots of nutrients in there. So um, they, okay, now one thing is that they dress like silver fishmen. 
It says silver fish on their sigil, and it is the silver armor, which reminds us of the Roinar, who also wear silvered fish man armor. Now, of course, a silver fish is it's a bug. It's a, kind of a nasty looking ins- All insects are kind of gross looking. Or not, if you like insects. But silver fish, specifically, they live in damp wood. Rotting wood and damp wood. And I think that is the reason why all the fish are silver. And this is my uh, Australian First Peoples... Uh, a, it's, a wat- it's a handmade... It's, represents the waves. I'm sorry, I was tongue-tied there. It represents the waves. It is silver. Also got a silver hand on the back. This is the hand of the artist that made it, which is cool. Because, of course, we got the green hand stuff and all that. In any case, silver fish live in damp wood. And damp wood is a big part of what we're talking about. As far as the weirwoods being trees that mediate the river of time, grow near the river, all that stuff. And we're going to see the, the river run god's wood. It's especially damp. And there's a lot of rain symbolism having to do with the rain god and the, you know, uh, Mother Earth. You know, basically, when you look at rivers, it's two parts of it, right? It's rain and the earth. When the rivers nourish the earth, they're nourished by the rain. And so we see a lot of rain river and mother earth ideas associated with house tully and of course catlin is one of the most prominent mother goddess or mother archetype figures in the story her and daenerys are two of the big ones so um let's see here they believe in watery halls and this is the thing i keep making a big deal about we're going to see it in the hoster funeral Yes, and yes, I did catch the new Disputed Lands video about uh, Garth Greenhand and why was he green and the Weirwoods originally being green. Very cool. Of course, Disputed Lands, highly recommended channel if you like my channel. So check that out. Crow Food's daughter doing fine work. <coughs> um, so, yeah, she pointed out that the, the, the Undying are eating or they're drinking shade of the evening, which is made from the blue leaves of the trees, and they're turning blue. So how did the green men get green? Maybe the weirwoods used to be green. You know, the weirwood leaves now are like red hands. Maybe they used to be green hands. And that's, you know, Garth green hands. So maybe the weirwood paste used to be green. And that's how the green men turn green, which is pretty interesting. Pretty cool. So check that on Undisputed Lands. I definitely don't mind shouting out Crowfood's daughter, again, she does great work. And if you like my sort of symbolic analysis, you'll love all her videos. My Dracomorph video is piggybacking on her Origin of Dragons video. So if you like the Dracomorph stuff, check out her two Origin of Dragons videos. And uh, she's actually the one who told me about the Green Man mythology like almost 10 years ago when I was a babe in the woods and didn't know anything about Kernunos or any of that stuff. Oak King, Holly King, so, yeah, always gotta give respect. Amanda, if you're out there watching, hope you're doing well. Anyways, the Riverlands, uh, the Watery Halls, so we're gonna, we're gonna get there, but it sounds exactly like the language that Asha uses talking about, you know, the, the Watery Halls, where we go when we die, and the mermaids blow seashells, and it's, it's the same as the Patch Face language. And as I've pointed out, the watery halls are a thing. The deep ones in Lovecraft lore have underwater cities that they build just offshore of the places they want to farm. And we see that on the Thousand Islands, they believe in watery halls. They believe in a bunch of ruins and cities that are under the water. Uh, The Ironborn believe in it, and the Tullys believe in it. And it's not just... You know, in the Thousand Islands, the maesters are like, oh, well, the water's risen and they're ancient ruins, you know. And, of course, with the Ironborn and the Tullys, they're just beliefs about whatever. But, no, there's really are, there really are watery halls. Those are the deep one cities underground. And Patchface has probably been to one. Aaron's been there. That's what he saw. And it's why he's crazy. Check out the Aaron was Patchface video. And the Tullys believe in watery halls. So I've got a theory about how that may have happened. Because the Deep Ones don't inhabit rivers. They only inhabit the sea, as far as we know. And the Tullys live on a river, so there's a bit of a mystery there. And I think we're going to solve it today. So I've got a little theory as well as symbolism. 
Devoted to Mariah, I have to tell you that when I put on this flannel, I did think of you. Well-known 90s enthusiast, devoted to Mariah. I, of course, I'm trying to do the red and blue Tully colors. Here, that's what's going on. It's thematic. Um, yeah, so. Hey, Minty Maelstrom. Good to see you. Good to see you. Yeah, it's hard, hard to imagine me as a wee babe that doesn't know Kernunos, but there was a time. So thank Amanda. Go watch her video in thanks. Uh, <laughs> We all owe her a big favor, right? Now, I, are the Tully Beliefs because the Iron Man ruled over the Riverlands? I don't think so, Mike Hall, uh, because the Ironborn ruled over the Riverlands in more recent time, and the Tullys are an ancient first men house, even though the name sounds like it would be an Andal name. And they're a first man house. Um, so... I don't think so. And the other thing about the Watery Hall's belief is that the Tullys have converted religions twice. So they would have worshipped the first men for a time. Or not the first, I'm sorry. The Weirwoods, like the other first men before the coming of the Andals. And then they've converted to the worship of the Seven. And yet they still have the Watery Hall's belief. So the Watery Hall's belief must be an original, very old, deeply set in belief that can't be erased even as they change religions and have a God's wood and a sept and all this stuff. This is like their oldest idea. Matt Folger. Lady Stoneheart is a fish caught in the weir. Indeed, she lives in a weirwood cave, of course, and she is a catfish. We're going to talk about catfish too. Unnaturally brought back from watery halls, interrupting the river of time, the flow of life and death. Exactly. Exactly. You're, that was a very good synthesis of ideas. Comment. The others, as I've said, they want to stop the river of time. The wall is compared to a river or a stream. So the whole idea is like the others by the long night is stopping the river of time. The day night cycle is stopped on night. The cycle of the seasons is stopped on winter. And so literally the others are freezing the river of time and the wall is a symbol of a frozen river. So there you go. Oh, we have a disputed land sighting in the chat. What's up? There you go. I'm glad you heard your glad you heard the shout out. Because I've meant it. It's from the heart. Glad you're doing well. Good to see you. And I did like the video. I did. In any case, um, so let's see, red and blue river. And I hope you're checking out my ironborn videos, Amanda. I'm thinking about you a lot. <laughs> with the Ironborn videos. And I've got like, well, I've only done one so far, but I've got like four more coming. So in any case, watery halls, where were we? I just got turned around. Uh, catfish. Oh, was that? Oh yeah, it was that. Pay okay, right. So yeah, just freezing the river of time. Well, that's, that's about it. I've said what I need to say. We'll come back to that for sure, so. Uh, the other, and well, that, okay, that is the, I'm sorry, <laughs> that's what we're supposed to talk about next, actually. So, again, mediators of the river of time, we're going to unpack the Blood Raven metaphor in a minute, but yes, River Run is a castle that sits where one river adjoins another, where the uh, Tumblestone joins the Red Fork, and so it's kind of a Y that is formed. And actually, I'll pull up the map. So you've seen this bit here, I'll pull that down. I've got, oh, the map is over here. That's right. We'll go for this detailed Riverlands map. This one is by Nocturnal Cartography. So River Run is right here. It's big. It's the biggest castle on the map. And you can see to the left is the Tumblestone. And to the south is the left and south. <laughs> to the west is the, is the Tumblestone coming down from the hills those are the same hills of the Westerlands that, you know, ha have Casterly Rock and Castamere and all those mines. Lots of mining in the Westerlands. So the Tumblestone comes down from those hills. So it's very, um, it's called the Tumblestone because it's probably got a lot of rapids. It's descending from the hills. So it's a lot of froth. Probably a lot of rocks in the river. Probably a good river to pan in, you know, if you're a 49er type. And then to the south is the Red Fork. So the Tumblestone joins the Red Fork. And as we're going to read, the castle is built in the little 
crotch of the where the rivers meet. And what they can do is open a sluice gate to connect the two rivers with a moat. And that creates a triangular island. So River Run is actually an island castle. And we're supposed to think about that because we're going to compare it to the Isle of Faces and the Quiet Isle and other sacred islands. And that's kind of the point. So as this castle that sits on this river junction, and they are the river lords, of course, the lords paramount of the Riverlands and the Trident, they are the rulers of the river. They're the river people. They control the river. You get, you get the idea. Okay, now, so the River of Time is obviously mediated and controlled by the Weirwood Net and the Green Seers. And so that is a major line of symbolism for the house. Finnegan's Wake, again, a very complicated book. It's about circular time. The very first word in the book is River Run. And we'll get to that in a second because there's a whole thing about the first sentence of the book. But yes, River Run, the, the name of the castle is the first word in the book Finnegan's Wake. And there's a lot more Finnegan's Wake that's tied to River Run, but that's where the name comes. And Finnegan's Wake is a book about circular time and cycles, and it's written in a non-linear fashion where the last sentence of the book is a fragment that loops around at the beginning of the book. And I'll read you that sentence in a moment. So Blood Raven's River of Time metaphor, which I've already mentioned, is a big part of this. He's Brendan Rivers, but of course we have a Brendan Tully, and the Tullys being the Lord of the Rivers. So there's some comparisons there. And Bran, being part Tully, obviously, uh, is jokingly is, is a merman because he's, his legs don't work, right? So if he's not in his wheelchair, he's dragging his legs around just like a mermaid would flop around on the shore because he can't walk on a tail. When mermaids, in The Little Mermaid, her tail's got to become legs so she can walk around. So Bran, <laughs> Bran is a merman. And he, of course, is swimming the river of time and all that stuff. So I'll, look, I'll unpack that in just a second. So there's going to be lots of weirs and lots of swimming and drowning. There's a weir, um, there's a, a weir that the Lannisters make that Blackfish swims under. Uh, the Inn at the Crossroads, which Cat is tied to, is a weir. And there's also, well, there's more. Um, then there is lots of swimming that happens. Of course, Hoster's funeral happens in the river. Blackfish, again, swims under the gates and escapes from the castle. And Catelyn is thrown into the river and then pulled out of the river. And by the way, we're going to read the quote that I skipped last time. Arya's dream of pulling Catelyn from the river. We will read that because I skipped it in the wolf dreams. I forgot it. It's not on... I mean, I, mean, I was saving it for today. That's right. And yes, poor cat. We'll spare a moment for poor cat. Um, there's some gates. There's basically all the versions of the weirwood metaphor are here. So the weir is here. There's a lot of gates going on. And then there's also a lot of hanging as a weirwood metaphor. If you remember, um, Edmure is, he's, he's like made to stand on the gallows for like days. And they don't ever hang him. He just stands there with a noose around his neck. So there's, We'll read that scene as well. We'll get the get a couple of funny Jamie scenes today too. Jamie confronting Black or Blackfish confronting Jamie, I guess it would be, and then also Jamie um, cutting down Edmure from the gallows. He's confronting the phrase, and that's it. So we'll get some good Jamie action. We need to read more Jamie chapters, by the way. He's he's as funny as Tyrion, low key. Anyway, um, and then so as far as the characters of the house that we're going to talk about. Hoster, his archetype, he's kind of like an old man of the river, which is the Rhoynish turtle god of the river. Hoster embodies the river. He very much is an old, peaceful man ruling over a peaceful time, except for, actually, <laughs> you know, there are some dirty secrets. But, again, that's we'll talk about, like, Cat and Lysa and the Tansy Tea and all that stuff. In a, in a different stream. We're not going to do a lot of character stuff today. 
but we know what you did, Hoster Tully. Um, cat, like I said, is a mother goddess figure, a big Nissa Nissa figure with the catfish symbolism. And uh, she becomes a crone slash stranger when she is Stoneheart, right? And then we've got Lysa. She's straight up Night's Queen all the way. And this is what I was saying about Cat and Lysa. Cat is doing this and this stuff. And Lysa is doing Night's Queen stuff. And they start out the same and they sort of go opposite paths. And Brendan remarks on that exact thing. Um, we might not do as much Lysa today as Blackfish. We'll do some Lysa. We've done a lot of Lysa Night's Queen stuff. Um, and the Night's Queen is a little bit separate from the rest. It's almost like she's left House Tully and transformed. And that's the whole thing about Night's Queen. So we'll do some of that, but not as much. Uh, Blackfish is the one we haven't talked about much. Blackfish is a symbolic Night's Watchman and, in fact, a last hero figure. And he's very interesting because he can swim back and forth across the weir. And so symbolically, he can sort of go into the frozen lands and back out again. And that's going to be, that's the last hero motif. And of course, he has the obsidian blackfish uh, brooch, which is his symbol. Shout out to all my squishers. In the audience, by the way. Appreciate y'all. And then there's Edmir. Edmir basically seems to be showing us like a young green seer. Like there's some parallels to young Bran's journey and stuff like that. <clears throat> so, let's start off with a theory. The origins of House Tully. Okay, again, where did they get this watery halls belief? Where did they get it? It's not, hang on. So the thing is that they don't live near the, the sea, like I said, and the squishers... They stay in the ocean. So where did they get this belief in watery halls? Um, there's a couple of possibilities. One, there, there are different water beings in the rivers. Okay? Maybe there are. Um, it's hard to see because most rivers, there are a few rivers, like uh, there's that one in Africa that's the deepest river in the world. It's incredibly deep. But most rivers are not deep enough to hide a secret civilization, fish people, okay? So I personally doubt that there are fish people in the rivers. And of course, deep ones are no different from any other aquatic life. You either are freshwater or saltwater, okay? There are some fish that can do, like catfish can live in coastal waters where the freshwater mingles with the saltwater. Uh, but for the most part, you know, you might find a species where there's a saltwater to freshwater version, but those are going to be very different. So the watery halls believe it's most likely that it migrated from the sea. That at one point, there are ancestors of House Tully who did not live at River Run, who lived near the water. Now, we know that in ancient Westeros, the Deep Ones had contact with humans on both sides from both oceans. We find uh, people worshipping uh, the sea and wind gods and having all kinds of beliefs about Merlings and Deep Ones in White Harbor, Cracklaw Point, the Three Sisters, um, the Stormlands, all over the coast. And then, of course, the Ironborn on the other coast. And there are other Selkie legends as well. They're actually all around the world. So, if the Tullys used to live near the ocean, then perhaps that's where it came from. Now, here's the thing. There is... The most ancient kings of the Riverlands probably is a house called House Fisher. This is their sigil here. It's a crowned, gray, spotted catfish 
on blue. Okay? And they, it's either them or the Blackwoods or the Brackens that were the first dynasty. Uh, but probably it was House Fisher. And we know that House Mud, who are the more famous ancient Riverland kings, came after House Fisher. Now, here's the thing about House Fisher. They were said to have their seat, they're an extinct house, and they were said to have their seat on some place called the Misty Isle. But the location of the Misty Isle has never been given. There are the Misty Islands, which became the Shield Islands down in the Reach. But those are different. They're more than one, obviously, and they're not in the Riverlands. House Fisher ruled the Riverlands from the Misty Isle. So yes, Jesse, there are two immediate possibilities that leap to mind. If it's an island that still exists, the two islands in the Riverlands are the Quiet Isle and the Isle of Faces. The Isle of Faces is a Riverlands house, or a Riverlands island. The whole God's Eye is in the Riverlands, technically. It becomes the Crown Lands, Crown Lands like just south. So I was wondering, since this sigil is a gray catfish and the Tully sigil is a silver trout, both of those being two of the most um, common and best to catch river fish that exist, right? So gray catfish, silver trout, the Tully's on red and blue, and House Fisher just on blue. So you could see that there could be a symbolic link here between the sigils if somebody from house fisher started house tully and we're told nothing about the origins of house tully except for that they're an ancient first man house and that they were never kings supposedly so the two the two choices for the misty isle well the three choices really are the quiet isle which to bring back the map is in it's at the mouth of the trident which is an interesting location for many reasons all of these rivers flow down to right here where it says salt pans. That's where the quiet eye, oh, the quiet eye, it's right here. Yeah. Almost to Maiden Pool. It's in the Bay of Crabs. And yeah, all, all the rivers that flow into the Trident, the different forks of the Trident, it all flows down here. And that's why stuff washes up on the quiet isle. So the quiet isle is interesting. There's this whole bay, it's fresh water that begins to mingle into the salt water, kind of like uh, the, uh, the Persian Gulf. Yeah. So the Quiet Isle's a potential location, and I'll come back to that in a second, and so is the Isle of Faces. The, the Quiet Isle is by the sea and could explain the squisher beliefs. If House Fisher ruled on Quiet Isle, then we're in the right place for squishers. They're sort of at the very edge of the freshwater domains. So the border between freshwater and salt water could make sense. Yeah, Valerie, that's what we're talking about. Exactly. The Tully funeral beliefs that they descend to watery halls when they die. Um, let's see here. So, by the way, uh, the catfish... The nickname for the catfish here in America, where George is from, is called Mud Cat. And of course, that's interesting because Cat Tully is essentially a catfish who gets thrown in the river and then pulled out of the river, out of the mud. Um, and there's uh, House Mud, again, is a, is a Riverlands house that takes over from House Fisher. And the Tully color, red, is the color of mud. So there's... There's a couple of catfish ideas sort of lurking in the background here of House Tully that would link us to House Fisher's catfish. Okay. Now, Fisher Kings. Obviously, if House Fisher were kings of the Riverlands, then that makes them Fisher Kings. And the Fisher King is a, an idea tied to the, the Grail and Arthurian mythology. And basically the concept of the Fisher King is, a, is that the king is tied to the land. When the Grail King takes a wound to his thigh, which basically means groin, 
It's, it compromises his fertility and his mobility, and the land gets sick and suffers. And so the king's health mirrors the land. It's an old folkloric belief. And it's actually, in A Song of Ice and Fire, it's flipped. The gender is flipped. It's the fish are queens that we should be thinking of. And so the, the moon is the fisher queen. And during the long night, of course, it's caused by the moon breaking, being slain from the sky, falling into the ocean in some cases. And so the, the health of the land fails when the moon disappears. And that's more similar to like Persephone mythology, where Demeter doesn't cause the spring to happen because her daughter Persephone has not come back from the underworld. So Fisher King, it's an idea that George is using a bunch of places. And there's also the Fisher Queens um, out in the Dawn Age uh, area of Essos. Okay, so we just mentioned the Roinar, right, with their silver fish armor. Well, not too far from the Roinar is an ancient inland sea called the Silver Sea, ruled by the Fisher Queens. And they ruled from a floating palace in the Silver Sea. Maybe that was something like what the Cranoglin have with uh, Grey Water Watch. Maybe it was a big flotilla of ships. Could have been, who knows what it was. Something more magical, maybe. But again, Silver Sea, Fisher Queen. Then we got Silver Fish, Roinar, and Silver Fish, Sigil Tullys. So there is something going on with the Silver Fish in the inland water, as opposed to the sea. The, you know, the, ocean, the salty sea. I think I'm going to praise Garth. Super duper quick. Check out my funky music. 30 seconds. Surely these gl new glasses will help me clear my throat. All right. So the thing about the Fisher King is that the Fisher King, again, it's an Arthurian idea. And so when we hear that the Fisher Kings ruled on the Misty Isle, well, that's, the, that's Avalon. And Avalon is just like the Isle of Faces. It's a magical island that you can't get to because the mists and the fog and the wind will steer you away. All the stuff that Martin talks about with the God's Eye, the, the Isle of Faces, that's all Arthurian and even like local older Celtic and Gaelic folklore. There's a lot, you know, the Druids um, hung out on a specific, I think it's the Isle of Man, I believe it is. The, well, the last the massacre of the Druids, I believe, happened on the Isle of Man. So there's a couple different ideas. Also, um, Baylor of the Evil Eye. There's an there's a island in a lake story there. Um, but, but the Fisher Kings ruling from a misty isle really suggests Avalon. And again, Avalon is just like the Isle of Faces. So if, the, if House Fisher was on the Isle of Faces, that would make a lot of sense for the mythology. Now, the Isle of Faces, of course, experienced a change at some point. Isle of Angelsley. Is that the, the one where the Druids were massacred on the Isle of Angelsley? Is that what you're answering, Genlob? I apologize. I, yeah, I did not research that right before the stream. That's, that's the fuzzy memory of something. But there, they were, they definitely lived on a sacred island, and that was definitely their last stronghold. So, in any case, 
Isle of Faces is suggested. Now, the Isle of Faces did go under, it underwent a change at some point, right? When the pact was signed, all the trees were given faces and the sacred order of green men was formed. So before that, who knows what the Isle of Faces was? Um, obviously a, a, a special weirwood place, uh, but that might be why the Fisher Kings were kings of the Riverlands. And in fact, there is a, an ancient Riverland legend. It's a one sentence legend. We know nothing else about it except for the title, a figure called the Green King of the God's Eye. Now, this could easily be a green man or a green seer first man that is basically basing his kingship on a connection to the green men. That seems to be what the Durandon did. They dressed up like green men. They built their castle around a weirwood and a weirwood cave. And they probably were related to green men or green seers. And we see a lot of the same thing with Gartha Green and High Garden. So the Green King of the God's Eye, yet another clue that green seers and green men or green men, first men hybrids were kings. <clears throat> ah, there it was. Um, but specifically, the Fisher King, like Garth the Green kind of is similar to the Fisher King in that Garth the Green represents nature, right? Like when he dies, that represents the cycle of the season. That's fall. That's when all the green leaves fall and all the trees turn brown and orange. That's Garth dying, and then he's resurrected in the spring, right? So he, like the Fisher King, is a king that mirrors the land, and he is a green man. So, green king of the God's eye, could that be a legend of ancient Fisher Kings? It definitely could be. And we know that the ancient first men were strongly connected to the green men. Again, Garth the Green is supposed to be the ancestor of all the great houses in the Reach and even possibly Lan the Clever and Brandon the, of the Bloody Blade, who then was the ancestor of Bran the Builder and the Starks. So the first men all over the place have connections to the Green Men. So House Fisher, the most ancient kings in the Riverlands, it's very easy to see that they might have had a Green Men connection. And if they lived on the Isle of Faces then they definitely would have. So, interestingly, House Fisher is said to have been defeated by either the Storm Kings or the Iron Men, meaning Green Men or Squishers, because the Storm Kings, like Robert, they all dress up like Green Men. They are symbolic Green Men. And the Ironborn dress up like Squishers. Okay, now, the interesting thing about that is that on the Isle of Faces, of course, there are green men. And then out on the, out on the what you call it, the Quiet Isle, they're right by Squishers. Now, Misty, okay. There's, remember I mentioned there's uh, the Shield Islands over in the Reach. And they, yeah, this is, this is a fun theory that, I, that, uh, that this is a totally new one here. So in the Reach, there are shield islands. They used to be called the Misty Islands. Now, not the same Misty Isle that we're looking for, but it does seem to be written as a parallel. Because here's what we know about the Misty Islands. They do the same thing twice. So first, Owen Oakenshield, the son of Garth the Green, has to drive off the Merlings and Selkies to settle the islands. Okay. Then later, Garth Gardner, the seventh, so another green man, Garth King, he drove the Ironborn off of the Shield Islands and renamed them the Shield Islands. So you see this historical echo. First, we have a son of Garth the Green driving off Merlings and Selkies. Then later, the Ironborn take, off, take over the islands. They are symbolic Merlings. And then we have another Garth figure come and kick them off again, and that's Garth Gardner the Seventh. So when we think about whatever island, Misty Isle, that the Fisher Kings lived on, we should think about Deep Ones and Green Men warring with each other 
and contesting. Like, that could be the story. Like, why is, where is it? Where'd it go? All right? <clears throat> and then we have the quiet aisle. The quiet aisle... is where the trident meets the sea, okay? It, I read the Quiet Isle chapter last night and my mind was blown. There is, there is a hill with a cave on the Quiet Isle, which you may remember. What I didn't remember is that everything inside was made of driftwood. The furniture, the seats, the cups, it's all driftwood. So it's like, oh, we're really thinking about Grey King and his Naga's Hill and the driftwood bones and all this, which is all green seer stuff. We'll, we'll, I'll talk about that at a different time. But the Quiet Isle is a holy island. And it's been that way for a long time. A couple thousand years at least. And it's where the trident meets the sea. So it's, a, it's, an, it's almost like where you hold the trident. And the trident, of course, is the weapon of the sea god. It's an emblem of power of the sea god. So... If the Fisher Kings that ruled the Riverlands were at the base of the Trident, like it kind of makes sense, right? Um, there could also be, could also be that there is uh, a, an island that's been drowned. We know that the coastlines have changed. We know that during the long night there was flooding. The hammer of the water sunk the arm of Dorne. And uh, it appears that the Iron Islands have also lost land into the sea. And so it could be, let me go back to the map, that somewhere in, say, like Ironman's Bay here, there could have been an island that has been lost. And so maybe that's where the sea, again, we're looking for squisher, fishman symbolism, watery halls beliefs. Where do they come from? Like, the Isle of Faces doesn't explain the watery halls part. It makes a lot of sense for House Fisher, but it does not explain where the Tully's got their watery hulls belief. And we don't know that the Tully's are connected to House Fisher. That's what I'm proposing here. And so, if it's not the Isle of Faces, and it's not the Quiet Isle, then it must be some island that doesn't exist anymore. Because if there was an island somewhere in the, you know, in the River Trident, big enough for a castle and a house... We'd probably hear about that. It'd be a little weird for George to just be like, oh yeah, it was in the middle of the Blue Fork on this island that's never been on the map. Like, eh, I don't think so. So it could be the Quiet Isle by the Sea or it could be on the West Coast. Because here's the thing. There is a house fisher of the Stony Shore. And the Stony Shore is in the north, of course. And it is unknown if there is a connection. Stony Shore is right here. So you see Iron Man's Bay, then Cape Kraken, the Salt Spear, the Rills, Stony Shore. Asha lands on the Stony Shore and uh, hits, hits Deepwood Mott and the Wolf's Wood from there. And there's Sea Dragon Point, just, just north of there. Okay? And the Iron Men have ties to this whole coastline. So... It seems like there could be a sunken island somewhere on the coast here. If House Fisher of the Stony Shore is connected to this ancient House Fisher of the Riverlands, then we would kind of think that they might be on the west coast here. And what's interesting is that House Mud, who is probably the second dynasty in the Riverlands, they rule from Old Stones. And Old Stones is right here next to Ironman's Bay. You see this white castle? Here, let me go in. This white castle, that's the ruins of old stones. It's on the Blue Fork. The Blue Fork is a spring-fed river. So there are springs that emerge from the ground here. And that's what feeds the Blue Fork. So it's the shortest river. It's probably not as big as the Green or the Tumblestone. But old stones is on the Blue Fork. And the headlands of the Blue Fork is very close to Seaguard and Ironman's Bay. And House Mud, again took over rule of the Riverlands after House Fisher, it seems. So what if House Fisher was close to here? That would kind of make sense. 
and then it would draw the connection to the stony shore and obviously it would put them well within range of deep ones and the ironborn mythology that sounds so similar and then it's only a short migration from there to river run so if they were on the quiet isle they would have followed the river to find this advantageous spot between the tumblestone and the red fork if the island was off of the coast here in ironman's bay then you can see it's only a short journey to river run now there's also let me put this map away there is also the only member of house fisher in this story is a fellow called lyman fisher and he is called a knight of old stones and lyman fisher briefly he he lives about a hundred a few hundred years before aegon's conquest he briefly declares himself king of the Riverlands and then is overthrown. It's assumed that he ruled from Old Stones because he called himself a knight of Old Stones. But he said his name was Lyman Fisher. So that implies there could be connection between House Fisher and, and Old Stones and House Mud. So yeah, it could be that um, the island would be offshore near there and that would that would make sense of that connection also sorry this is the one i was looking for so again old stones right here river run right here so yeah maybe misty isle was somewhere just offshore in ironman's bay now lyman fisher is an interesting name. First of all, Lyman, uh, one of the other Lymans that we know of in Ice and Fire, the most prominent, is a king who lives by the sea, and that's Lyman uh, Lannister, the sea lion, he's called. Lyman was a brand of handmade boats in the 60s. <laughs> cool. So Lyman the Sea Lion is an interesting name of House Lannister. So Lyman Fisher, just maybe it's a clue that they did live by the sea. Also, the name Lyman uh, Mund, it depends if you want M-U-N-D or M-O-N-D. M-O-N-D, Mond, means uh, mouth. And mund means hand, as in a guardian hand. So there's a lot of mund names like Tormund and stuff that are definitely tying into that guardian name. And we've seen the mouth used with the Manderleys, the mouth of the Mander, the Mander River. That's related to mund, mand, mund. Then we have the Axis Mundi. Which is, of course... The, the cosmic axis, which is what the weirwoods represent. So Lyman Fisher, the Fisher King, just an uh, interesting name. Yeah, Mund, right. In Latin, Mundus essentially means world. So axis Mundi is the world axis. So Lyman Fisher, yeah, think lies in ley lines, Mund is in universe. And it ties into the Fisher Kings. Okay, this is getting a little abstract. Let's let's move on. Let me get back to my my notes here. So that's that's basically what I got. If you, and then the other thing is that again the catfish sigil. Um, catfish live in rivers, but also coastal waters. So when you think about House Fisher and their sit, where they go, House there they are, and their catfish. It could just be anywhere in the river, um, but also, right, and also mound, Karsnark. Yes, thank you, mound, as in hill. Um, so, that, so, yeah, the fact that it's a catfish, coastal waters. So another clue that, again, watery halls of the Tullys, which is a coastal aquatic belief, another connection potentially to House Fisher. Really, that catfish just seems like such a giveaway. 
because obviously the Catlin is the catfish in the story. So also Grey King. This is this this is a Grey King that's a fish. And the Grey King married a mermaid and had fishy stuff. But of course the Grey King was also a green seer. So there you go. All right, let's get on with Finnegan's Wake because what I just talked about was confusing and we need something simple. Oh, we're going to do the River of Time first. Okay, that's easy. <laughs> so, Brendan River's River of Time. A man must know how to look before he can hope to see, said Lord Brendan. Those were shadows of days past you saw, Bran. You were looking through the eyes of the heart tree in your godswood. Time is different for a tree than for a man. Sun and soil and water... These are the things a weirwood understands, not days and years and centuries. For men, time is a river. We're trapped in its flow, hurtling from past to present, always in the same direction. The lives of trees are different. They root and grow and die in one place, and that river does not move them. The oak is the acorn. The acorn is the oak. And the weirwood, a thousand human years are a moment to a weirwood, and through such gates you and I may gaze into the past. We've read this quote a million times, but it's very important. So this is the weir metaphor. Okay, so a fishing weir is, it looks kind of like a crappy dam at first. Let me switch the art. This is River Run by Felix Sotomayor. Imagine a dam that's built just with very loose grating so that only the biggest objects are caught in the dam. And that is the point of the weir. Is it, the weir is primarily for fishing, can also be used to regulate the flow of the river to some, to some extent. And so it's basically a wooden thing built out across a river. And there's multiple ways to fish from a weir. You can have baskets that trap the fish, People can stand on the, winter, on the weir with poles or baskets on poles. Um, so they are for fishing. It's basically, if you don't live in America, you know this term. Like English people, Australian people, they use it very frequently. If they, the, the local dam just might be called the weir. It's basically interchangeable with dams. Specifically dams that allow water through and regulate the water flow. So the weirwood tree, it sits astride the river of time, but it's not moved by the river. So it's just like a weir. It's literally, George is saying, the weirwood is like the weir of the river of time. Now, men are trapped in the flow of the river because they're always going from past to future. They can't time travel. They're a prison of linear time. So they're in the river. But what does a fishing weir do? It picks fish out of the river. So when the weirwood strains you out of the river, and note that Blood Raven literally looks like he's trapped in a weir, right? He's got the wooden roots all around his body, and he's trapped. It's just like a fish caught in the meshwork of the weir. But when you're trapped in the weirwood, it's only your body that's trapped. <laughs> Still I roam, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to do that again. Okay, so I did sing Weezer to warm up today. So I figured Rivers Cuomo, Blue Album. Anyway, <laughs> where were we? So the Weirwoods are like rivers. They strain the green seers out of the river of time. So they're no longer hurtling in the flow. Now they have access to the entire river. So imagine them being like up in a tree with a good vantage point, and they can see the whole river. They can see the past and the future of the river. They can see its whole arc. When you're in the river, you can't, really. You can only see the waves around you and the fish. And, oh, there's a rock. Watch out. Um, when you're up in the tree, you can see the whole course of the river. And the green seers, similarly, can see the whole river of time. So this is great because it shows you that George understands what... a the word weir means. 
he's using the concept in the name. It's not a random name. Yes, it's named after Bob Weir of the Grateful Dead. But he obviously looked up the meaning and worked with it. Okay, so shout out to the Grateful Dead. So when it says the oak is the acorn, the acorn is the oak. It just means, yeah, they can see all of time. They're not trapped in the flow. They're eternal. And then the last part, through such gates, you and I may gaze into the past. So the weirwoods are like gates. Oh, the chat is stuck. It's happening a lot today. Boom. Come back to me. Hi there. How you doing? All right. So acorn is the oak. They can see all of time. They're eternal. And these are gates that green seers can gaze through into the past. Now, of course, weirwood gates are a thing. Weirwood doors, we've seen a lot of them, right? The black gate under the wall, that is a gate between the land of the living and the land of the dead. And it is a weirwood face. So that is a gate that allows passage beyond life and death, much like entering the weirwood net. Blood Raven has extended his lifespan. He's somewhere in between life and death. And then when he dies, he's not really dead. He'll be in the weirwood net. Then we see, of course, the moon door in the Eerie is a weirwood door. You fall through that and you die. You also fly. They call it flying, but you fall, just like Bran's dream of flying and all the ways that uh, green seeing is referred to as flying. Um, then we've got, uh, of course, the House of Black and White has weirwood doors. They're half weirwood and half ebony. But again, this is a realm of the dead. You go inside the House of Black and White, and now you are in the realm of the dead. Everyone is dead. You're a handmaiden of death. You worship death. Just like Bran is in Blood Raven's Cave, it's filled with bones. It's in the dark. Darkness is your mother's milk. There are beyond the realm of life and death in every sense. So this is the meaning of the, the river of time in the weirwood. Now, this is from the same chapter. The last green seer the singers called him, but in Bran's dream, he was still the three-eyed crow. When Mira Reed had asked him his true name, he made a ghastly sound that might have been a chuckle. I wore many names when I was quick, but even once I had a mother, and the name she gave me at her breast was Brendan. I have an Uncle Brendan, Bran said. He's my mother's uncle, really. Brendan Blackfish, he's called. Your uncle may have been named for me. Some are, still. Not so many as before. Men forget. Only the trees remember. His voice was so soft that Bran had to strain to hear. So, interesting here. Because, again, the name Brendan means cave home. Cave den. Den in a hill. So they're literally in a hill. They're both princes. And they're talking about Brendan Blackfish. But Blood Raven, his name is Brendan Rivers, and the Blackfish is a Tully, who are all associated with the rivers. So you can see how there's a lot of parallelism here. And then, again, we're going to get to a scene where the Blackfish swims under a weir that's built over the river. And that's kind of where this is all going to. So the River of Time, it's... What the Weirwood Net gives you. Shout out to Max. In the chat. What's the purpose of Blood Raven? Um, he's Mr. Miyagi for Bran. You know, he's uh, uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi. He's, he's the tutor. It's a, it's a role. It's just a very dark, dark version of the, of the archetype. So, Finnegan's Wake. Like I said, it's a very challenging book by James Joyce. The first sentence has the word river run. So, we know that George is using rivers as this river of time metaphor that has to do with escaping the trap of time. And the idea that the green seers can surf the river of time. So, Finnegan's Wake... It's a nonlinear story. It's reminiscent of a dream. Uh, the, it's a bunch of vignettes, and they are disassociated in time. I have not read this book, by the way. 
it is, again, a very challenging book. I do want to take it on. I think I can, might be the kind of person that could do it. But I have instead read a lot about this book. And that is the kind of book that it is. And there is the conversation about this book is so interesting. And it's very reminiscent of our conversation about A Song of Ice and Fire. And I think you guys are going to laugh when I read you some of the quotes of the people talking about Finnegan's Wake. <clears throat> so the characters in the book, there's a family of five that's the main characters. A mother, a father, two twin boys, and their younger sister. And they are always changing names. They reappear as different people with different names, but you can sort of tell who they are. They might have the same initials, okay? They sometimes appear as concepts or things, but it's the same idea, the same archetypal person. So already this should sound familiar as far as A Song of Ice and Fire, where all these people are Azor High, all these people are different versions of Nissa Nissa. So Finnegan's Wake is doing something like that, where the main characters are echoed out in all these different parallels, okay? So like I said, the last sentence is a fragment and connects to the first sentence, which creates a loop of the novel. And the end of the book and the beginning of the book have many parallel scenes. And so here's, here's the sentence. The end, the end of the book is a fragment, and it says, Away, alone, at last, a loved, along the. Away, alone, a last, a loved, along the. River run, past even atoms, from swerve of short to bend of bay, brings us by a commodious vicus of recirculation back to Houth Castle and environs. Now, just like A Song of Ice and Fire, this is stuff that you have to pick apart word by word. So Houth Castle and environs, and environs is just a way of saying Dublin. Um, because that's where Houth, Cast Houth Castle is. Now, HCE, that's also the initials of the father, the main character in the story, HCE. So this has led to people to understand that the castle is a symbol of the father and the river itself is a symbol of the mother. We'll get to that in a second. And so this, they are even Adam. And so that's why it says past even Adams from swerve of short to bend of bay brings us recirculation back to the beginning, back to the archetypal man and woman. And the river run, that's the river of time that's circulating us back from the, the end of the book back to the beginning of the book. All right? So the mother, her name is Anna Livia Pluribel. That's her dream name anyways. ALP. So Patrick McCarthy, one of the many people that's reviewed the book, describes HCE's wife, and this is from Wikipedia, ALP as, quote, the river woman whose presence is implied in the river run in which Finnegan's Wake opens and whose monologue closes the book. So remember, I said she's the river and the castle is the man. So it's like the woman is, as a mother, she is facilitating the rebirth of the character. Because here's the thing. Finnegan, Finnegan's Wake, the story begins with a funeral for this guy, Finnegan and his wake. And in the way of dreams, his body is like served at the funeral for everyone to eat, but disappears before it can be eaten. But who is Finnegan? Finnegan is Finn McCool, an Irish folk hero. And he's just called Old Finn in a lot of legends. He takes different forms, very well-known folk hero. And we mentioned Finn McCool in the Moat Kalen video. Remember, uh, the, the idea of that bridge that was built, the Giant's Causeway, Bend and Don are the Scottish giant trying to get over to the Irish side, right? And Finn McCool pretended to be a baby. And then Bend and Donner was like, oh, if the babies are this big, the adults must be huge. And he fled back over the causeway and tore it up, right? And this is part of the background of Mo Kalen. Well, that's Finn McCool. He's not always a giant, though, but he's always a folk hero. So th the story begins with the funeral 
of an Irish folk hero, basically the archetype of the hero. And then the main character of the book, HCE, is a parallel of Finn as sort of archetypal man. All right, so the story begins with this funeral for this hero and then transitions into the life of HCE. So that's who Finnegan is. It's very interesting. So we're dealing with, again, just like Ice and Fire, taking old mythology and paralleling it onto the characters in the story as a way of commenting on the archetypes of humanity. That's what I'm trying to communicate here. So skipping ahead, let's see here. Um, the most extensive discussion of ALP, the mother, the river woman, is in chapter 1.8, in which hundreds of names of rivers are woven into the tale of her life, as told by two gossiping washerwomen, who at the end of the scene turn into a tree and a rock, by the way. I think that's how weird the book is. So similarly, hundreds of city names are woven into Haveth Childers Everywhere, the corresponding passage at the end of part three. And note, HCE, this is just another name for HCE, the father. So he's associated with cities, she's associated with rivers. So it is generally contended that HCE personifies the Viking founded city of Dublin and his wife personifies the river Liffey on whose banks the city was built. So again, this is all archetypally Irish, the setting of this. So he's at he's certain in certain senses, he's giving commentary on local folk heroes and culture, but really he's just using those as a vehicle to talk about the archetypes of, you know, the city represents man because man builds things, right? And is sometimes in conflict with nature, whereas the river is the mother. She is mother nature. She is a mediator. Okay. So this is, this is the idea here. So getting into what Joyce said about Finnegan's Wake, he said that it was an attempt to reconstruct the nocturnal life and that his book was an experiment in interpreting the dark night of the soul. These are ideas that Martin's working with heavily. <clears throat> Joyce stated that Finnegan's Wake would be written to suit the aesthetic of the dream where the forms prolong and multiply themselves and once informed a friend that he conceived of his book as the dream of old Finn lying in death beside the River Liffey and watching the history of Ireland and the world, past and future, flow through his mind like the flotsam on the river of life. So people, look, he's telling you what this book is about right there. People have debated about, like, is it really a dream and who's the dreamer and all this stuff, right? However, he's telling you right there who's the dreamer. The dreamer is old Finn. Finn is everyone. He's, he's the hero. He's the archetypal man. So think of this, this hero, Finn. He's lying beside the River Liffey as if he were the city of Dublin. And he's watching the history of the world flow through his mind like flotsam. So it's, it's as if all of history is the dream of this hero. Or you could just say like the dream of mankind's universal unconscious, really. Because the, the dream is experienced, it's almost like the reader is a spy on the dream. If the story is a dream that someone's having, we're sort of like sitting in on the dream and the narration is giving commentary on it. Okay, so I hope this is interesting, guys. I hope went deep on Finnegan's Wake last night. It's, it's very compelling stuff. And this is, again, by naming this, the place River Run and doing all this stuff with the River of Time, it's very clear that Martin read and understand this book and he's pointing at it going, look, this is the kind of book that I'm writing. A book where every sentence contains references to stuff. A book where the characters represent archetypes and heroes. And we should look at the folk tales is paralleling the figures in the book. And in fact, HCE is actually called Finn McCool in one scene. So it's not even that cryptic. So I love that. It's like Dublin itself, the city, is conceived of as Finn. And it's sort of 
Just like the way the weirwood tree experiences the whole of river of time and it's not trapped in the flow and it can see the past and the future at once, the dream of this city is the story here. And so it's all these vignettes and sometimes the characters are very symbolically paralleled and it, this, the, little, the little vignette doesn't seem to have anything to do with the main family and the main story, but it actually does because that's kind of how dreams work. You might dream a dream that's totally symbolic. It might be about your girlfriend or boyfriend or your parents, but the dream will take this weird symbolic form. So, this is what Martin is pointing at. Uh, to, to keep reading from Joyce, he said, pondering the generally negative... Because, of course, this book got negative reactions. <laughs> of course it did. I can't understand some of my critics, like Pound or Miss Weaver, for instance. They say it's obscure. They compare it, of course, with Ulysses, which is his previous greatest work. But the action of Ulysses was chiefly during the daytime, and the action of my new work takes place chiefly at night. It's natural things should not be so clear at night, isn't it now? And so, one of the things that I think George is inspired by is this love of uncertainty. And so this whole book is written, and in fact, one of the central things about this book is that H.C.E., the father, he committed some sin in the park that he's in trouble for, and his wife is trying to exonerate him with this letter. We never get to read the letter, and we never find out what the sin is, because it's not important. It's an archetypal thing. It's Adam's sin in the garden. It's in the park, so it's pretty obviously the Garden of Eden sin that they're really talking about here, the original sin. So we don't know what it is. And there's a lot in Finnegan's Wake about, oh, well, you can't know exactly what's happening because this whole story of Ireland or this family or whatever, it's being experienced as a dream. It's all chopped up and disassociated in time. And so here's a, here's a quote from the book that I think Martin might have on his wall somewhere. It says, Thus the unfacts, did we possess them, are too imprecisely few to warrant our certitude. One more time. Thus the unfacts, did we possess them, are too imprecisely few to warrant our certitude. So the truth is undermined like four times there. So it's basically saying, if we had the facts, they, they're actually unfacts. We don't have them. And if we did have them, not only are they unfacts, but they're too few to l let us be sure about anything. So it's kind of, you see how ice and fire works that way. All the unreliable narrator stuff. Nobody really knows what the truth is. And it's a lot more important what people believe than what actually happened. So that is, that is a taste of Finnegan's Wake. <clears throat> now, uh, Nicholas Fagnoli and Michael Patrick Gillespie, who wrote James Joyce A to Z, The Essential Reference to the Life and Work, suggest that the book's opening chapter introduces the major themes and concerns of the book, and that's the actual wake of Finnegan, and enumerate these as Finnegan's fall, the promise of his resurrection because he disappears from the funeral, the cyc cyclical structure of time and history, dissolution and renewal, tragic love as embodied in the story of Tristan and Isolt, uh, the, and I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, sorry, the motif of the warring brothers, the personification of the landscape, meaning people that represent the land, and the question of Earwicker, that's the father, H-C-E, the E is Earwicker, that's his dream name, Earwicker's crime in the park, and the precise nature of it, which is left uncertain throughout. Uh, such a view finds general critical consensus, viewing the vignettes as allegorical appropriations of the book's characters. So, so there's a vignette called the Willington Musy Room, which represents the book's archetypal family drama in military history terms. So it's a little bit of military history, but it's supposed to parallel the family. Um, Joyce himself referred to the chapter as a prelude and as an air photograph of Irish history, a celebration of the dim past of Dublin. And remember, he's using Dublin as a vehicle to explore the question of man. So, of course, he's going to use Dublin history 
as a parallel for these characters. That makes perfect sense. So the typologies of human experience that Joyce identifies are essentially, are essentially cyclical, that is, patterned and recurrent, in particular the experiences of birth, guilt, judgment, sexuality, family, social ritual, and death recur throughout the wake. In a similar enumeration of themes, Tyndall argues that the rise and fall and rise again, sleeping and waking, death and resurrection, sin and redemption, conflict and appeasement, that's a big one in Ice and Fire, and above all, time itself are the matter of Joyce's essay on man. So he calls this book an essay on man and says that the topic above all is time, but also all of these cyclical ideas. So again, ice and fire, cycle of the seasons, cycle of death and life, cycle of day and night, the morning star rising and falling. It's all cycles. And again, above all, it is trauma and um, grudges and hate turning into healing, reconciliation. It's the major theme of the story. So you can see how inspirational this book is and how much it has in common with Ice and Fire. Um, let's see here. Anthony Burgess sees HCE, the father, through his dream trying to, quote, make the whole of history swallow up his guilt for him. And to this end, HCE has, so deep in his sleep, sunk to a level of dreaming in which he has become a collective being rehearsing the collective guilt of man. So again, you go back to the Garden of Eden, original sin, and all that stuff. And then there's one last thing I want to read. Uh, it is appropriate that the waters of the Liffey representing Anne Olivia, the mother, are washing away the evidence of Earwicker's sins, as the washerwomen speak, uh, for they tell us that she takes on her husband's guilt and redeems him. Alternately, she is tainted with his crimes and regarded as an accomplice. All right. Tristane in our story is engaged to a princess from a rival house who apparently had her ear wicked off. Yeah, and also I think it has to do with listening. So, all right. I didn't, man, I've still got the same amount of viewers as I did 20 minutes ago. You guys are, that's insane. I thought I was going to lose at least 100 people with that stuff. If you're watching the stream, give it a like. But again, what's the point of all that? The point is that River Run is a direct nod to Finnegan's Wake. And why? Because Finnegan's Wake is has tons in common with Ice and Fire. Not only the themes, but the way it's constructed. With all these references, with the archetypes, with the mythical parallels. So George is kind of, again, he's telling you what kind of book he's writing. These are the people. These are his heroes. <laughs> you know? Everyone dozed off. Oh, that's what it is. They, they didn't log. They just dozed off. So I, the views are rolling. Hey, it works for me. I came back halfway through still working out where we are, says Minty. Yeah, good luck with that. You might have to rewind. It's okay. River of Time. It's a circle. River Run represents that. And uh, Finnegan's Wake is complicated. There you go. So the Tully Colors, as I said, they represent the river. And that, we're going to build on that river of time stuff. Like, don't worry. We're going to come back to that. I'm sorry for the abrupt transition, if you will. But uh, oh, I'll tell you what. I'll play some music and come back, and then it'll be an actual segue. One moment. You want to do mythical astronomy or Rhaegar again? We'll do mythical astronomy. <laughs>
So one of the funniest things about the people d- debating Finnegan's Wake uh, was that like some people were like, well, it's, he said it's a dream. It's like a dream. And other people were like, no, it's not literally a dream. That's oversimplification. And then other people are like, you shouldn't even summarize Finnegan's Wake because any summary just robs the book of all its complexity. So you just got to read it. And, but then you read it and it's confusing. It's, it's, yeah, it's really funny. It's, it's good stuff. <clears throat> okay, so the Tullys are introduced. This coloring is introduced early on. Um, so this is from that first ca- uh, Brand chapter. Oh no, first Catlin chapter, and this is Rob and John talking about the execution that they watched. The deserter bri- died bravely. Rob said he was big and broad, growing every day with his mother's coloring. The fair skin and red-brown hair and blue eyes of the Tullys of River Run. And that's contrasted with John, uh, who says, you know, John's eyes are a gray so dark they seemed almost black. Now, gray so dark they seemed almost black is the exact same description that is given of Valerian Steel Ice only a chapter before. So this is an early clue that John is a Valerian, if you will. I have a feeling that very dark gray that's almost black probably is very dark purple because purple and gray eyes are, it's hard to tell the difference. Very dark gray, very dark purple. It just, it's all having to do with the light. John's always in the north. Um, you know, the dark star's eyes look black but are actually very dark purple. So, gray so dark it looks black. That's the description of Valerian Steel we got a chapter before. Actually, no, in the same chapter. Because it's this Catelyn chapter. It's in the same chapter, right? So John's a Valerian. Meanwhile, Tully, Rob, the coloring of the Tully, fair skin, like think of fair, think of fair skies. Again, Tully means peaceful. Red brown hair. So their sigils, their sigil colors is also their personal colors, just because George likes to go heavy handed on his symbolism. So they have blue eyes and muddy red hair. And their sigil is mud red like the river and the blue of the river water. So there you go. Pretty straightforward. This is Catelyn and Blackfish talking about the comet and color symbolism. It's pretty funny. Uh, Catelyn raised her eyes to where the faint red line of the comet traced a path across the sky, the deep blue sky, like a long scratch across the face of God. The great John told Rob that the old gods have unfurled a red flag of vengeance for Ned. Edmure thinks it's an omen of victory for River Run. He sees a fish with a long tail in the tully colors red against blue. She sighed. I wish I had their faith. Crimson is a Lannister color. That thing's not crimson, said Sir Brendan said, nor tully red the mud of the red the mud red of the river. That's blood up there, child, smeared across the sky. Our blood or theirs? Was there ever a war where only one side bled? It's a great line from Blackfish there. Her uncle gave a shake of the head. The Riverlands are awash in blood and flame all around the god's eye. The fighting has spread south to the Blackwater and north across the Trident, almost to the Twins. So here's the thing. A couple of things I want to point out about this quote. One, one of the main points of the river it's not just the river of time, but also the crossing of a river, like the river Styx, right? The river Styx is the crossing point between life and death. Like I said, the wall is a symbol of the river of time. And you cross over it, and you go into the frozen land of the dead. So in a lot of these Tully quotes and Tully scenes, pay attention to any time people are crossing rivers, is what I found reading all this stuff, Okay. So the Riverlands are awash in blood and flame all around the God's eye. That's mythical astronomy. The God's eye is the sun-moon alignment. It's blood and fire. Okay, so that is blood and fire in the sky. That's long night symbolism. It's Tywin's dogs that did it. The sun's hounds, you know. Um, So then here on parallel on the ground... Uh, and of course, it's the comet that struck the moon. That's the obvious part. So it's like he's looking up at the comet and he's like, oh, the God's eye is awash in blood and flame. So it's just Brendan, he's just doing mythical astronomy. 
But the point is the Tully is the red of the river. And this blood and fire is, is destructive. And so we see the Riverlands themselves are washed in blood and flame. But then it says, the fighting has spread south to the black water and north across the trident. So when it crosses the trident, and remember that was a big thing for Rhaegar and Robert who fought at the trident and Danny thinks about crossing the trident, like crossing the Rubicon, like Caesar. That was the moment of decision when he crossed the river, right? So they cross when it crosses the trident, that's when it's threatening the Riverlands seriously. Like south of the trident, that's southern Riverlands. Once it gets north of the trident, that's where a lot of the cities are and stuff. So it's really sweeping across the Riverlands and it's crossing the river. The wave of destruction. Um, and so only, not, yeah, both sides are bleeding. And then the comet itself is a scratch across the face of God. And of course, Catelyn will become an image of, you know, the crone, the stranger, and she's got the ten scratches across her face. And right before that in the sept, she looks at the face of the mother and it had a crack across its face with Catelyn being the mother. So it's all foreshadowed. And the moon is like the mother and it, the comet scratches its face. And Yeah, so. Let me keep going. I've got a lot of stuff I want to read, so. That is pretty basic stuff. When at last she heard sounds outside her door, and this is Catelyn in River Run, uh, she has let Jamie out, and so she is, she is in big trouble. She's in timeout, and she's waiting for Edmure to come back from battle and scold her, basically. When at last she heard sounds outside her door, she sat and folded her hands in her lap. Dried red mud spattered Edmure's, uh, Edmure's boots, greaves, and surcoat. To look at him, you'd never known, you would never know he won his battle. He was thin and drawn, with pale cheeks, unkempt beard, two bright eyes. So bright blue eyes, and he's spattered with mud. So it's almost like he's walked out of the river. Or we're just, there's lots left. <laughs> lots left in this dream. So here's, this is like the Riverman thing come to life. And then it said, um, Edmure, Catelyn said, worried. You look unwell. Has something happened? Have the Lannisters crossed the river? And he says, I threw them back. Lord Tywin, Gregor Clegane, Adam Marbrand, those are the three Tywin's dogs who set the, the God's Eye on fire, the Riverlands on fire all around the God's Eye. Those are the three dogs. He threw them back at the river. I turned them away. Stannis, though, he grimaced. Stannis? What of Stannis? He lost the battle at King's Landing, Edmure said unhappily. His fleet was burned, his army routed. That was another battle on the river. That was another river battle if you remember, with the whole bridge of ships. The bridge creates a weir, and it then gets set on fire. Because remember, the weirwood is symbolically a burning tree, like Moses' burning bush, like the Grey King's burning tree that gave the fire of the gods to mankind. So you have a burning weir at the Battle of King's Landing. Check out the Battle of the Blackwater Streams. But it's cool, the double river, refer uh, river reference. So Edmure, Lord of the River, has thrown... Yeah, it's a kind of an inversion of Cerberus, isn't it? Usually Cerberus, nice call, Carsnark, or no, uh, Barris Aurelius. Usually Cerberus guards the river, three-headed dog. Here, Tywin's dogs, and there's three of them, are trying to cross the river, and it's the Tully Riverman that throws him back. So that's kind of fun. That's a total inversion of Cerberus. That's great. <laughs> That's very funny. I'm so glad you caught that. <clears throat> anyway. So, River Guardians and Mudman. Nice little quote there from Edmure. Then, uh, same chapter. After the maester had gone, she donned a woolen cloak and stepped out onto the balcony once more. Sunlight shimmered on the rivers, gilding the surface of the waters as they rolled past the castle. So that's interesting. Gilding the surface of the waters... It's because gold is usually 
you know, it's it's symbol of sunlight, fire of the gods. So it's gilding the surface of the river as they rolled past the castle. Catelyn shaded her eyes against the glare, searching for a distant sail, dreading the sight of one. But there was nothing, because she's waiting to see if somebody's captured Jamie and Brienne. And nothing meant her hopes were still alive. All that day she watched, and well into the night, until her legs ached from standing. A raven came to the castle in late afternoon, flapping down on great black wings to the rookery. Dark wings, dark words, she thought, remembering the last bird that had come and the horror that it had brought. So, River Run... Uh, the chat is not frozen. So, Catelyn talks a lot about watching from this balcony. Watching for Hoster, watching... It's in, it's in the Whispering Woods bit, which we're going to read. Um, so, there's kind of like... I guess I should explain the catfish thing here. So, Catelyn is... As Stoneheart, we see her inside a weirwood cave in the underworld part of the weirwood. That's where dead children of the forest and green seers and stuff live. Now, the whole theory about Nissa Nissa is that she is a child of the forest. And Azor High uses her for blood magic to gain access to the weirwood net powers. And so, many of the Nissa Nissa characters are cat women or mermaids. Because they're both, both of those things imply them as tied to the green sea. The mermaid swims in the sea and in the river of time. Okay? So that's simple. There's a lot of mermaid women that are Nissa Nissa figures. Especially all those mermaids that during God's grief and Grey King are marrying. Also, Hugo Hill's wife. Eyes like blue pools. Supple as a willow. Willows grow right by the river. So there's all these aquatic women, all that mermaid stuff. It's talking about Nissa Nissa as being a woman of the green sea. Danny, a Nissa Nissa character, goes out into the green grass sea and is reborn. Okay? Same idea. Nissa Nissa always in the sea. And then the child of the forest have cat eyes. And cats are good at climbing trees. The children of the forest live in trees. That's why they're squirrel people. Arya is compared to a squirrel. She also goes by Cat of the Canals. Catelyn is a cat woman. Sansa has cat's eyes and is cat's daughter. Cersei is a lioness. Um, who are some of the other cat women? I know there's more. Oh, um, Rohan Weber, who becomes a Lannister and whose braid coils like a cat in her lap. That's a good one. So fish women and cat women. And then Catelyn is a catfish. Now, at the Red Wedding, which we're not going to read because it's horrible, at the Red Wedding, we see something called the Weirwood Stigmata. This is a major symbolism of House Tully uh, that ties to all this Weirwood Net stuff, and Catelyn specifically. And I will just recap it so we don't have to read the bloody scene. The idea of the weirwood... So the regular stigmata is when someone manifests the wounds of Christ on the cross. The, th uh, the thorn wounds on the brow and the cross wounds, the nail marks, right? That's called the stigmata. It's, it's, we don't need to talk about it. It's a folkloric idea. It's, it's uh, something people believed happened sometimes. So the weirwood stigmata, I named it that because it seems that George likes to show these because remember, everyone's representing an archetype. So the way he shows these archetypal figures going into the weirwood net, being sacrificed to the weirwoods or forcing their way in or anything like that, is they manifest the weirwood stigmata, the wounds of the weirwood tree, which are bloody eyes. Because the weirwood's face is carved and bloody. So if people have a carved face, if they're, have, if they're crying tears of blood, if they have wounded eyes that are bleeding... They have blood in their eyes or blood red eyes, any of those things. Catelyn at the red wedding claws her face and it talks about the red tears and the white tears. So she's got a carved face. She's got bloody tears. She gets blood in her mouth. The weirwood also has a bloody mouth. Catelyn bites down um, on, on, I forget, on somebody and gets blood in her mouth, just like she does with the cat's paw assassin. Um, she has blood in her hair from being yanked. 
Um, and that is uh, gives the weirwood hair is the leaves, which look like bloody hands. Catelyn also has blood on her hands. Um, Catelyn, in the end, gets her throat cut. A throat cutting is called a red smile, and it's a carved bloody smile. The weirwoods have carved bloody smiles. So Catelyn, at that red wedding scene, gets every single possible wound that you could have to reflect the weirwood tree. And then she gets thrown into the green fork of the trident. So thrown into the green water, the green sea. And of course, the trident river is associated with the magic of a sea god because that's Poseidon's weapon. So it's, it's, <laughs> it's doubly... It's doubly symbolic of going into the Green Sea when she's thrown into the Trident. Um, then when she's resurrected, she lives in a weirwood cave. So it's, it's a layered, repeated symbolism of this archetypal Nissanissa mother figure who in life is a, is a, a weirwood goddess figure. She is a tree woman, a cat woman, a child of the forest, child of human hybrid, something like that. Then when she dies, she becomes a spirit inside the weirwood net. And so we often see her sitting inside of a weirwood place and watching things. So she hangs out at River Run on the balcony, watching the river, the gilded river. That's the river of time. So just as the green seers can see the whole river, Catelyn is here at River Run, the place where time loops around in a circle and she can see the whole river, and she's just waiting, 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 and watching. So you start to see how that works, right? Now it's all coming together. You see why I was talking about Finnegan's Wake and Blood Raven? What's that got to do with Tully? Now you start to see. So let's go to the introduction of River Run, and this means we're going to go over to uh, the Kindle. Oh, I didn't write down what book it is. What book is it? This is going to be Clash of Kings. Nope, it's going to be a Kindle crash. Sometimes that happens. Um, let me just grab my drink, fresh drink. No hold music. Just a new drink. While well, Kindle reopens. There, you guys send that crash report in for me. <laughs> that was a hard reset. Came up on a different screen. Everything. Oh, I got a couple PayPal's real quick I will shout out. Kelly Johnson, will the Song of Ice and Fire series come to its shattering conclusion in the Riverlands? Will the Isle of Faces or the God's Eye be the site for the final battle? Good question. Um, we are going to see the Isle of Faces, I believe, and Danny dreams of confronting the others on the Trident. Now, it seems to be that that's because Rhaegar's big battle was on the Trident, and Danny's thinking about her big battle confrontation against the Slave masters and eventually her confrontation against the others will be her big battle. So it may not be literally on the trident, but it could be. Could be. Um, be an interesting parallel. So I could definitely see that. If the others are going to like really have a good long night, they need to get they need to like take over. You know, they need to get further south than Winterfell. I do think they will get past Winterfell. And I do think the God's Eye might be their target. I like that idea, you know, to really freeze the Weirwood Net. They have to get to the Isle of Faces, or maybe that's how they get back in the Weirwood Net. So that'd be funny. We're supposed to let the others reach the Isle of Faces, actually. <laughs> Could be. So good question, Kelly. Very possible. And yeah, okay, so you had a second question. already answered it about... Uh, about the Danny and the God's Eye. So then, all right, let's find this quote and read this part of this chapter. It's a little too long to copy. Oh, nope. Maybe it's Game of Thrones. 
didn't want to copy it all into my notes. There we go. Uh, <laughs> I told you Kindle's unstable. I told you guys. I wasn't lying. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry, guys. This happens sometimes. It is not my fault. Oh, we have to search it again. Wow, I didn't even remember its place. Doing basic stuff here. Okay. It seemed a thousand years ago that Catelyn Stark had carried... We'll go to a new, new picture, too. This is uh, River Run by Donato Giancola. It seemed a thousand years ago that Catelyn Stark had carried her infant son out of River Run, crossing the Tumblestone in a small boat to begin their journey north to Winterfell. So crossing the river to begin a new phase of life, and we're going to Winterfell. And it was across the Tumblestone that they came home now, though the boy was wore plate and mail instead of swaddling clothes. Rob sat in the bow with gray wind, his hand resting on the direwolf's head as the rowers pulled at the oars. Theon Greyjoy was with him. Her uncle Brendan would come behind in the second boat with the great John and Lord Karstark. Oh, whoops, I gotta... Catelyn took a place toward the stern. They shot down the tumblestone, letting the current push them past the looming wheel tower. The splash and rumble of the great water wheel within was a sound from her girlhood that brought a sad smile to Catelyn's face. From the sand sandstone walls of the castle, soldiers and servants shouted down her name and Rob's. Winterfell. From every rampart waved the banner of House Tully, a leaping trout, silver, against a rippling blue and red field. It was a stirring sight, yet it did not lift her heart. She wondered if indeed her heart would ever lift again. Oh, Ned. Poor cat. Okay, so let me pause there. The Wheel of Time is a series by Robert Jordan, as most of you will know. Big influence on George Martin. There's a House Jordan in the Peaks of the Tor. Tor Publishing published Robert Jordan. Now, the Wheel of Time is a concept... Buddhist concept, I believe, is where Jordan got it, but it's just what it sounds like. It's a way of depicting cyclical time. Okay? So, there is a house called House Wayne Wood up in the Erie. And House Wayne Wood sigil is an eight spoked wooden wheel with one spoke broken. Now, the eight spoked wheel specifically is the cycle of the seasons in pagan mythology, like Imbolc, Beltane, all that stuff. That's that is the, I think it's the Celtic cycle of the seasons. It's, it's a widespread concept now. I'm not sure where it came from originally. But basically, it's the four seasons and the four in-betweens. So you get eight spokes. So when you see a, 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 an eight-spoked uh, wooden wheel with one broken spoke, um, and specifically, it's the spoke that corresponds to winter somebody found that is broken on the Waynewood sigil. Let me just pull it up real quick. That is winter. So the winter, the cycle of the seasons is broken. That's what the Waynewood sigil means. Yes. So the upper right spoke, whichever one would, I don't, somebody tell me which Celtic month that is or period, but that is, that's winter, and it's broke. So this, this is the Wheel of Time. So when we're talking about River Run, a place with circular time, it represents circular time, and the River of Time. There's the great wheelhouse with the water wheel, and it brings back old memories for Cat. That's the thing. Cat in this whole chapter is experiencing two times at once. She's in a reverie about when she left with Rob, and now she's coming back echoing and repeating in reverse the cycle that she, remember, and now River Run brings us back to Health Castle and environments by means of recirculation. So that's what Kat's doing. She's returning. Is it, is it in bulk? Uh, the winter? Uh, yeah. So you see how this has worked. Kat is coming back to River Run, and she's experiencing this circular time as she's looking at the great water wheel. It's pretty great stuff. And you can see what kind of things I've been shopping for lately. Guitar pedals. Yes, sir. 
I bought like two of the ones on this page already, so I don't need to see those anymore. <clears throat> yeah, there is also a Hindu Wheel of Time. And the Dragon Reborn represents the rebirth of Vishnu. Oh, okay. Oh, you're saying um, uh, the Wheel of Time in uh, Jordan is drawing on the Hindu Wheel. Yeah, I've got a picture of that, actually. Uh, if you check out my Kali video in on my other well, my Mythic Concepts YouTube channel, which is linked in the description below, you can see some awesome pictures of the Vedic wheel, which goes back to the Proto-Indo-Europeans who made their living because they hooked up wheeled wagons and chariots to horses. That was their whole thing. So the wheel was very sacred to them. And thus they grafted uh, the wheel. They used it as a symbol for, you know, a lot of things, including the cycle of the seasons. So getting back to the wheelhouse. And wait, so here's the thing. It represents the cycle of time, right? Now, the ice dragon constellation. We're, this, this, we're going deep today, folks. I hope your brain is ready for this. The ice dragon constellation in A Song of Ice and Fire is essentially Draco. And the eye of the ice dragon is the North Star. Now, Draco in our own world does sure enough wrap around the North Pole. And because of the cycle of precession, the actual North Pole wanders around a little bit. And so few, few, few eons ago, um, there was a, one of the stars in Draco, I think it might have been Thuban, was the North Star. Okay, so that is what George is talking about. When he says, Ice Dragon, there's a star, it's a North Star there. That's just Draco. Okay, now, the cool thing is that in a different story it might be bitter blooms i forget what george has a preliminary idea that comes before this ice dragon idea and it's called the ice wagon instead of the ice dragon that's the constellation that contains the north star it's the ice wagon but why is it called the ice wagon it carries the souls of the dead to the afterlife and of course um the uh there is a wheel in the sky also, and that is the Big Dipper, which essentially creates kind of a swastika-like shape, which, of course, the Nazis didn't invent that symbol. It's thousands of years old. The thing that looks like we've seen it in different directions. Uh, if you look at any Vedic art, you'll see it uh, diagonally reversed for the way that the Nazis... Anyways, go check that out. I, I don't have time to do that whole spiel, but it is the swastika symbol, and it is, it comes from uh, the Big Dipper because the four, four different, basically it makes a, a panhandle shape. And so if you freeze it at the four positions of the seasons, it creates that shape. And so that is why the swastika has been used exactly in Baris Aurelius in many cultures around the world that have no connection to each other. So multiple people, including the Siberian hunter-gatherers, noticed this thing that the Big Dipper does and it is a convenient way to depict the wheel of the seasons and the cycle of the seasons <clears throat> so one of martin's north star myths is based on draco and it's called the ice dragon and the other one is based on the big dipper which makes a wheel and it's called the ice wagon and so the ice wagon takes the souls of the dead to the afterlife so that's part of the cycle of life right so now, let me introduce you to Utheride's Wayne. This is just primo wordplay here, okay? Sir Desmond Grell had served House Tully all his life. And this is that Catelyn chapter where she's held a, she's a prisoner. She's, she's in time out at River Run. He had been a squire when Catelyn was born, a knight when she learned to walk and ride and swim, master at arms by the day that she was wed. He had seen little Hoster's, a Lord Hoster's little cat become a young woman, a great lord's lady, a mother to a king. And now he had seen me become a traitor as well. Her brother Edmure had named Sir Desmond Castellan of Riverrun when he rode off to battle. So it fell to him to deal with her crime. To ease her discomfort, he brought her father's steward with her, dour Utheride's wain. The two men stood and looked at her, Sir Desmond's stout, red-faced, embarrassed, 
Utheride's grave, gaunt, melancholy. Each waited for the other to speak. So, Uther rides Wayne. Other rides Wayne. Wayne is a word for wagon. So, other rides the wagon. Which wagon? The ice wagon. Others also ride the ice dragon. So, either way, ice dragon or ice wagon, the others are riding that thing. Okay? And so here, a steward in River Run is other rides wagon. Okay? And we just saw the wheel tower. So we can see River Run has a big water wheel and a wheel tower. Okay? That's the wagon wheel of time. That's what, again, House Wayne Wood represents the wooden wheel, right? That's the wheel of the ice wagon. But because the others are riding it, they have broken winter, they have broken the wheel, have frozen the river of time. And so that is why here at River Run, which represents the river of time and the weirwood net, we should also see symbols of what the others do to the river of time, what the others' agenda is. And so the Lord Hoster's steward is the other that rides the ice wagon. Okay, you guys see what's going on here. So are we thinking too hard about ice and fire? No, we are not. <laughs> this is not. Uther rides. That's not a fucking name. Okay, that's not a name. That is word scramble. That is, that is, <laughs> that is something George made up. That's a sentence. Just like Lucifer means Lightbringer is not a name. That's a sentence. It's a true fact. It means Lightbringer. <laughs> the others ride the wagon. I'm sorry. This is just really funny. Oh, and King Arthur's dad is named Uther. Of course. <laughs> Uther Pendragon. And we've talked about how Night's King is a frozen King Arthur. Just like Arthur Dane wearing his Night's King, you know, his other armor at the Tower of Joy. So yeah, Uther rides Wayne. That's cool. Even better. And there's also um, Othor. You know, the first one of the first Night's Watchmen that's turned into a frozen white that John fights in Mormont's chamber? That's Othor instead of Other. So he represents the Others. He's got an ice moon face, and he's a Night's Watchman, just like Night's King was a Night's Watchman. Oh, man. <laughs> I was up till like six in the morning putting this together and I was just like, oh man, I hope I can present this in a sensible way because this is some of George's most devious, circuitous wordplay here. But hopefully it's all making sense. You guys tell me, is this making sense? Ah, there we go. Okay, so... Skipping ahead says, Sir Desmond nodded, Plainly glad to have been done with this distasteful task, but sad-eyed Utherized Wayne, Utherides Wayne lingered a moment after the castle and took his leave. It was a grave thing you did, my lady, but for naught. So he's, he's grave, he's gaunt, melancholy, sad-eyed. Yeah, it's great. It's great. Of course, the others also are specifically gaunt, and they are from the grave. So getting back to the chapter that we just interrupted, there's a little more I want to read. So Catelyn took a place toward the stern. Oh, I said that. The water wheel, it was a stirring sight. She's remembering things. She's remembering Ned's death. Below the wheel tower, they made a wide turn and knifed through the churning water. The men put their backs into it. The wide arch of the water gate came into view. And she heard the creak of the heavy chains as the great iron portcullis was winched upward. It rose slowly as they approached, and Catelyn saw the lower half of it was red with rust. The bottom foot dripped brown mud on them as they passed underneath. That's fun. The barbed spikes mere inches above their heads. Catelyn gazed up at the bars and wondered how deep the rust went, and how well the portcullis would stand up to a ram, and whether it ought to be replaced. Thoughts like that were seldom far from her mind these days. And of course, this is a really good setup for Blackfish escaping under this gate. 
because the way that they do it is they raise the gate just a little bit so that he can swim under it, but it's still in the water. And you can see only the bottom foot is down in the mud and the rest of it is underwater. So he's, he's just sort of set up the escape here. <clears throat> and then um, it says, uh, thoughts like this were seldom far from her mind these days. They passed beneath the arch and under the walls, moving from sunlight to shadow and back into sunlight. Okay, so that reminds you of Daenerys, who to reach the light has to pass beneath the shadow. That probably talks about her getting knowledge from Ashai and stuff, but in a thematic sense, you know, it's talking about being reborn. And Daenerys already has been symbolic, symbolically reborn. She may get resurrected like Jon, potentially, as well. But going under this gate, the water gate, remember, the weirwoods are gates through which Bran and Bloodraven can gaze at the whole river of time. So they are water gates. And we're also going to talk about the bloody gate that is defended by Brynden Blackfish. Okay? So these are all weirwood gates, gates to the river of time, etc., etc. So they're moving through this gate. This is passing into the weirwood, or into the weirwood net, essentially. Boats, large and small, were tied up all around them and secured to iron rings set in stone. Her father's guards waited on the water stair with her brother. Water stair, that's a good symbol. Sir Edmure Tully was a stocky young man with a shaggy head of auburn red hair and a fiery beard. His breastplate was scratched and dented from battle, his blue and red cloak stained by blood and smoke. At his side stood Lord Titus Blackwood, a hard pike of a man with close-cropped salt and pepper whiskers and a hooked nose. Grey King alert! His bright yellow armor was inlaid with jet in elaborate vine and leaf patterns and a cloak sewn from raven feathers draped from his thin shoulders. Hello, Grey King, Titus Blackwood. Um, he's got gray whiskers, yellow armor like the king in yellow and like the Greyjoys wear yellow capes. He's a pike of a man. And from House Blackwood, which has a dying, petrifying weirwood tree, and the Grey King's Hall is petrified weirwood, and he was a green seer. Boom. We're going to have to come back to Titus Blackwood another day. But Edmure, he has a fiery beard, and Blackfish has a fiery hair that has gone gray. So there's a whole thing about fire, Azor High, fiery person going into the weirwood net and losing that fire. That's kind of what Edmure and uh, Blackfish are going to be talking about. So let's see here. Um, it had been Lord Tidos who led the sortie that plucked her brother from the Lannister camp. Nice. Bring them in, Sir Edmure commanded. Three men scrambled down the stairs, knee-deep in the water, and pulled the boat close with long hooks. When Grey Wind bounded out, one of them dropped his pole and lurched back, stumbling and sitting down abruptly in the river. The others laughed, and the man got a sheepish look on his face. Theon Greyjoy vaulted over the side of the boat and lifted Catelyn by the waist, setting her on a dry step above him as the water lapped around his boots. See, that's the thing about Theon. Just time out for Theon. When no one's watching, he'll abuse women and people. Like, we saw the disrespect for the fisherman's, uh, the captain's daughter on the, on the Murham ship that he took. But it's like everyone's watching, and it's, oh, it's Catelyn, and so he makes a big show of, of being being polite. It's just typical Theon. Anyway, Edmure came down the steps to embrace her. Sweet sister, he murmured hoarsely. He had deep blue eyes and a mouth made for smiles, but he was not smiling now. He looked worn and tired, battered by battle, and haggard, and strain, uh, haggard from strain. His neck was bandaged where he had taken a wound. Catelyn hugged him fiercely. Let me see here. She wants to see father. He awaits you in his solar. Lord Hoster is bedridden. I'll take her. Edmure escorted her up the water stair and across the lower bailey where Peter Baelish and Brandon Stark had once crossed swords for her favor. So more time flashback. The massive sandstone walls of the keep loomed above them. <clears throat> As they pushed through a door between the two guardsmen in fish crest helms, she asked, how bad is he? Dreading the answer even as she said the words. Edmure's look was somber. He will not be with us long, the maesters say. 
The pain is constant and grievous. Let's see here. The keep was three-sided, like River Run itself, and Lord Hoster's solar was triangular as well, with a stone balcony that jutted out to the east like the prow of some great sandstone ship. So that's interesting. Um, you think about Sunspear. They have the sand ship. It's a fortress that looks like a ship. It's made from sandstone. What's the commonality? Like... The point is that the Weirwoods are like a ship, okay? The Grey King sailed a Weirwood boat, and he was a Green Seer. And the Green Seers used the Weirwoods to navigate the River of Time. So therefore, the Weirwoods are like a boat that the Green Seers can use to sail the Green Sea. And so since River Run is ba basically the castle represents a Weirwood tree, in case I did say that, obviously enough, um... And again, it, the being on an island is like the Isle of Faces with its weirwood trees. So it being like a weirwood tree. Oh, geez. What was I saying? Oh, the sand ship. Right. So being like a weirwood tree, it should also be like a ship. Sorry. Because it is sailing the river of time. It is a vehicle that the green seers can use to navigate the sea. So, of course, it is a ship. Um, from there, the lord of the castle could look down on his walls and battlements and beyond to where the waters met. So, again, just like the green seer in the tree, you can see the whole river of time. They had moved her father's bed out onto the balcony. He likes to sit in the sun and watch the rivers, Edmir explained. Father, see who I've brought. Cat has come to see you. So, Hoster as an old man in this weirwood tree, we should think about him as being like Blood Raven. He's bedridden, right? Just like Blood Raven is kind of bedridden. He's stuck to that throne. So they've moved him out onto the balcony so we can see the whole river. So it's pretty straightforward stuff. Let me look up the meaning of the name Hoster real quick. Because I forgot to do that. Hoster means hood maker. Huh. That's interesting. Occupational name for a hood maker. Well, I have to put on my dragon hood then. It's, it's just about cold enough for it, too. All right, this costume is getting more complicated as we go. So you hood makers, you guys are hosters. Interesting. So yeah, old man looking out at the river of time. It's Again, it's very Finnegan's Wake. We think of Finn. Remember, the book is characterized as this hero, Finn, lying by the river, Liffey, and shout out to Radiohead. Float down the Liffey. That's what that's referring to. Um, just like Hoster, he's laying here in a castle by the river, River Run, and and his, yeah, his memories are floating in and out. He's looking at the river of time. LML was the hood man all along. <laughs> Even death cannot free you from my service. <laughs> That's right. <clears throat> you knew it was me. I'm everybody on this channel. Oh, I just Google. I just Google, and then I look... You can tell which websites have more credible meanings or not. A lot of times it is Wikipedia. So then, let's see here. So yeah, Hoster's on the balcony. He's watching the River of Time. And as the scene unfolds, you'll see his memories are floating in and out. Hoster Tully had always been a big man, tall and broad in his youth, portly as he grew older. Now he seemed, a sh he seemed shrunken. The muscle and meat melted off his bones. Even his face sagged. The last time Catelyn had seen him, his hair and beard had been brown, well streaked with gray. Now they had gone white as snow. His eyes opened to the sound of Edmure's voice. Little cat, he murmured, in a voice thin and wispy and racked by pain. My little cat. A tremulous smile touched his face as his hand groped for hers. 
I watched for you. I shall leave you to talk, her brother said, kissing their lord father gently on the brow before he withdrew. You guys are just now figuring out that I'm a Sith Lord. I'm the dragon LML. You didn't know I was a Sith. Come on now. Come on now. Tim, my new apprentice. <laughs> Rule of two. Hello. Okay. Glad we had this chat. Catelyn knelt and took her father's hand in hers. It was a big hand, but fleshless now, the bones moving loosely under the skin, all the strength gone from it. You should, so he's turning into an other kind. He's got snow hair, bone hand. It's because he's dying. He's moving into the, you know, that part of his life. Right, okay, um, let's see here. You should have told me, she said. A rider, a raven. Riders are taken, questioned, he answered. Ravens are brought down. A spasm of pain took him and his fingers clutched her hand. It clutched hers hard. The crabs are in my belly. Pinching, always pinching, day and night. They have fierce claws, the crabs. Maester Vyman makes me dream wine, milk of the poppy. I sleep a lot, but I wanted to be awake to see you when you came. I was afraid. When the Lannisters took your brother, the camps all around us. I was afraid I would go before I would see you again. I was afraid. I'm here, father, she said, with Rob, my son. He'll want to see you too. Your boy, he whispered. He had my eyes, I remember. He did, and does. And we've brought you Jamie Lannister in irons. Riverrun is free again, father. Lord Hoster smiled. I saw. Last night, when it began, I told them. Had to see. They carried me to the gatehouse. Watched from the battlements. Ah, that was beautiful. The torches came in a wave. I could hear the cries floating across the river. Sweet cries. When that siege tower went up, gods. Would have died then and glad, if only I could have seen your children first. Was it your boy who did it? Was it your Rob? Yes, Catelyn said, fiercely proud. It was Rob. And Brynden. Your brother is here as well, my lord. Him. Her father's voice was a faint whisper. The blackfish came back from the Vale. Yes. And Lysa? A cool wind moved through his thin white hair. Gods be good, your sister, did she come as well? He sounded <clears throat> so full of hope and yearning that it was hard to tell the truth. No, I'm sorry. Oh, his face fell and some light went out of his eyes. I'd hoped I would have liked to see her before. She's with her son in the Erie. <laughs> That's doing a lot of work, <laughs> that sentence. Lord Hoster gave a weary nod. Lord Robert now. Poor, Ar poor aaron has gone. I remember. Why did she not come with you? She's frightened, my lord. In the Eyrie, she feels safe. She kissed his wrinkled brow. Rob will be waiting. Will you see him and Brynden? Your son, he whispered. Yes. Cat's child. He had my eyes, I remember. When he was born. Bring him, yes. And your brother? Her father glanced out over the rivers. Blackfish, he said. Has he wed yet? Taken some girl to wife? Even on his deathbed, Catelyn thought sadly. He is not wed. You know that, father. Nor will he ever. I told him, commanded him, marry. I was his lord. He knows my right to make his match. A good match. A red wine. Old house. Sweet girl, pretty, freckles, Bethany. Yes, poor child, still waiting. Yes, still. Bethany Redwine led Lord Rowan years ago, Catelyn reminded him. She has three children by him. Even so, Lord Hoster muttered, even so. Spit on the girl, the Redwines. Spit on me, his lord, his brother, that blackfish. I had other offers. Lord Bracken's girl, Walter Frey. Any of three, he said. Has he wed? Anyone? Anyone? No one, Catelyn said. Yet he has come many leagues to see you, fighting his way back to River Run. I would not be here now if Sir Brendan had not helped us. He was ever a warrior, her father hussed. That he could do. Knight of the Gate, yes. He leaned back and closed his eyes, inutterably weary. Send him. Later. I'll sleep now. Too sick to fight. Send him up later, the blackfish. 
All right. Let's see. Catelyn kissed him gently, smoothed his hair, and left him there in the shade of his keep, with his rivers flowing beneath. He was asleep before she left the solar. When she returned to the lower bailey, and yes, Blackfish, Blackfish is gay. That's, I mean, that's the only way I read that scene, guys. Did he marry some girl? Any girl? Just a girl? Did he get married at all? Nope. And you know he will never marry. It's like, why would they know that he'll never marry? I mean, it's just the obvious explanation. So, yeah, that's, that's my opinion. Let's see here. <clears throat> I'm not sure, like, I'm not even sure what the other explanation would be. So, and then there's a couple more here. See, when she returned to the lower Bailey, Sir Brendan Tully stood on the water stairs with wet boots, talking with the captain of River Run's guards. He came to her at once. Is he dying, she said, as we feared. Her uncle's craggy face showed his pain plain. He ran his fingers through his thick gray hair. Will he see me? She nodded. He says he is too sick to fight. Blackfish chuckled. I'm too old a soldier to believe that. Hoster will be chiding me about the red wine girl, even as we light his funeral pyre. Damn his bones. <laughs> Catelyn smiled, knowing it was true. All right. I think that's... Uh, I think that is as much as we need to read from this. Yep, yep, that's pretty much it. Oh, there's one more wheel tower. The river wind moved through the high branches in the god's wood, and she could see the wheel tower to her right, ivy crawling up its side. As she stood there, all the memories came flooding back to her. So the river of time is flooding back her memories as she looks at the water wheel. It's just like, <laughs> it's great stuff. Her father had taught her to ride amongst these trees, and that was the elm that Edmure had fallen from when he broke his arm. And over there, beneath that bower, she and Lysa had played at kissing with Peter. She had not thought of that in years. So it's like, yeah, looks at the wheel tower. She's in the God's Wood. And then the river of time floods the memories back, and she's thinking about all the things she's done here in the God's Wood. So, pretty cool. Let me go back to the outline. And I'm going to take a quick Garth break. And we're going to come right back. Yeah, this is going to be a good long stream. Where's my music at? All right, we're done with the hood. Because we're not in Hoster's hood anymore. But we'll chain, we'll go to, uh, this is River Run by Ted Nasmith. So yeah, and when they, when they, when they do the sluice gate thing and uh, isolate the river, the castle from the land, it, uh, the walls do rise sheer from the river. So the castle is like an island itself. Yeah. Some people think the blackfish is asexual, but the asexual thing doesn't fit to me. The idea that like he's so hardened again, like Hoster's bitter about it. He's like, why won't he marry? Hasn't he married? A like he still wants him to have married a girl. Like Hoster is in denial about 
blackfish lichen dudes it seems to me and that's why he still wants to know that he's somehow married he's like he's holding on to this idea that he'll marry a woman and it's like no he never will so i don't know like being gay in that world is a very clear demarcation like being asexual i don't even they don't even have terminology for that so I'm just, it's just gonna be like, oh, you know, the blackfish just doesn't like kissing. So he's never going to get married. Like, I don't know. The way, yeah, the way he said any woman is, yeah, exactly. That's, that was the giveaway to me, but it, it's not clear. You could debate it if you want. That's just my reading of it. So, okay. So, ah, uh, time for the boom and the gallows. This is, this is going to be good. <clears throat> that's true. The point is that he doesn't like women. That's what we know. So that could be asexual or he likes dudes, either one. But I just like the fact that he's stubborn. And for whatever his reasoning is, he wasn't going to be forced into one of these arranged marriages. So got to like that. Medieval society sucks. That's why we, that's why we like Rhaenyra. You know, like she's not perfect, but she's somebody who fights against the crappy circumstances that she's held prisoner to and that's easy to like you know she doesn't do it perfectly but you know what medieval life sucks and uh it's good to see it get some comeuppance once in a while anyway okay so the boom and the gallows we have the castle well encircled sir ryman and the phrase are north of the tumblestone and this is forley prester giving a Report to Jamie. The castle is well encircled. Sir Ryman and the Freys are north of the Tumblestone. South of the Red Fork sits Lord Emmon with Sir Forley Prester. Okay, so this is somebody else, not Forley Prester, but it's somebody giving a report to Jamie. Sir Forley Prester and what remains of your old host, plus the river lords who came over to us after the Red Wedding. A sullen lot, don't mind saying. Good for sulking in their tents, but not much more. So all the sulkers and people of questionable loyalty are on one side of the river. So as again, you see the river being used as a divider. <clears throat> it seems like he likes women. He just doesn't want to sleep with them. <laughs> Good point, Jenny. Yeah, no, he's not a, he's not a, some sort of chauvinist. He's very, he's a fine gentleman, actually, Blackfish. Very good manners. All right, so let's see here. <laughs> um, Mine own camp is between the rivers, facing the moat and River Run's main gates. We've thrown a boom across the Red Fork, downstream of the castle. Manfred Yu and Reynard Rudiger have charge of its defense, so no one can escape by boat. I gave them nets as well to fish. It helps keep us fed. Okay, so get ready. The boom. When they say they built a boom across the river, that's a weir. That's a wooden, it's, it's a little, it's, it's, a, it's a dam, but it's not meant to stop the flow of the river. It's just meant to stop boats, big things, and they can fish from it. So it's a fishing weir. And it's built across the river right in front of River Run. Okay. Now, flipping over to my legendary essay, Garth of the Gallows from five years ago or something. We're going to, I'm going to, we're going to talk about these two fellows who are in charge of the weir because they're interesting fellow. Yes. Merman. Okay. So they've built a boom across the river. It's meant not only to catch ships, it's meant to catch tullies that are trying to escape. And Blackfish is going to swim under this weir, this boom. Okay, but it's for catching fish, and they're fishing. So, one of them, the two names, again, Manfred U and Reynard Rudiger. Okay, so a U is a tree. So one of the people on the weir is a tree man. He's Manfred Yu. And this is the sigil of House Yu 
it looks like a damn weirwood. A white tree on red. I mean, it literally looks like a weirwood. It's an hourglass shape with a golden longbow in the center. And U is popular for longbows. That's why there's a longbow in their house, U. Um, but the hourglass, of course, is a symbol of time passing. So it's a white tree symbolizes the passing of time. And this guy is standing on the weir. Now, the name Manfred means strength and peace or hero's peace. And what does Tully mean? Peace. So he's a, a peaceful tree man sitting, standing on the, on the, on the, I mean, it's, again, this can't be coincidence. This is how we know is because the deeper you crawl into the symbolism of this book, the more it correlates. And yes, weirwood bows are also a thing. Blood Raven uses weirwood bows. Thank you, devoted to Mariah. So there's a tree person manning the weir. Now, who's the other guy? Reynard Rudiger. Well, that's a variation of the German Rudiger, uh, which is equivalent to Roger. And the meaning comes from Old German. It means fame and spear. And that's interesting. Uh, they're both heroes' names. And one is a tree, the other is a spear. Well, we've seen the 79 Sentinels they're Night's Watchmen holding spears that are planted like trees. And they represent tree people and Night's Watchmen. And Sentinel is the name of a tree. Okay. Um, and then we've also seen uh, hanged men on a gallows tree referred to as grizzly sentinels. So again, the... Oh, I guess I didn't talk about that. The hanged man is an Odin thing. Odin hung on... Uh, Yggdrasil for nine days and nights in order to transcend life and death and see the runes. He fell from the tree, seized up the runes. Then he had the power of the runes. Okay. So hanging translates into a song of ice and fire as another death metaphor, like the weirwood stigmata that represents somebody going into the weirwood net, transcending life and death, gaining the power of the weirwood net. So gallows tree... They're grizzly sentinels, the hanged men on the gallows trees. But, of course, sentinel is a, is, a, is a word for a tree and a person like the 79 sentinels. So, Reynard Rudiger, he's a famous spear. That's what Reynard means. Or, that's what, I'm sorry, Rudiger means. Um, Rudiger sounds like root. It's the obvious one. Could have said that first, I guess. But, so he's a man who's taking root in the middle of the weir. Um, and then, of course, Odin is also impaled on Yggdrasil by his own spear, Gungnir. So, Reynard Rudiger is a spearman taking root. There you go. And then, um, let's see here. Uh, right, so in his report, oh, it's Davin Lannister giving the report. He says... Uh, yeah, fishing from the boom will keep the men from starving, but the foragers who go out into the woods are found ripening under trees with ropes around their necks. So they're both doing the same thing. It's, it's all weirwood transformation. A gar is a fish. I knew that. I knew that. Okay, so that's enough. We don't need to read any more of this crazy essay. But you can check out Garth of the Gallows at lucifermeanslightbringer.com if you want to. Or right there at the link. So that that is the boom that is across the river. So we'll go back to this Jamie chapter. The last day of their journey was cold and gusty. The wind rattled among the branches in the bare brown woods and made the river reeds bow low along the red fork. Even mantled in the winter wool of the Kingsguard, Jamie could feel the iron teeth of that wind as he rode beside his cousin, cousin Davin. It was late afternoon when they sighted River Run, rising from the narrow point where the tumblestone joined the Red Fork. The Tully Castle looked like a great stone ship with its prow pointed down river. Its sandstone walls were drenched in red gold light and seemed higher and thicker than Jamie had remembered. This nut will not crack easily, he thought gloomily. 
If the Blackfish would not listen, he would have no choice but to break the vow he'd made to Catelyn Stark, the vow he'd swore whose king came first. The boom across the river and the three great camps of the besieging army were just as his cousin had described. Ryman Frey's encampment north of the Tumblestone was the largest and the most disorderly. A great gray gallows loomed above the tents, as tall as any trebuchet. On it stood a solitary figure with a rope around his neck, Edmure Tully. Jamie felt a stab of pity to keep him standing there day after day with that noose around his neck. Better to have his head off and be done with it. <clears throat> um, there are several gay women in this story, uh, by the way, chat. Um, Raina Targaryen is one of the coolest ones, and uh, she has some of her, one of her girlfriends, uh, Melanie Piper, plays a huge role in the Dance of the Dragons in the war. Hmm. I'm getting that confused. Melanie Piper... Oh, it's a different war, I think. That's, yeah, that's the war against uh, Magor. Sorry. Not the Dance of the Dragons. <clears throat> yeah, Fire and Blood has a bunch. <clears throat> Let's see here. Um, oh, so, he's on a Grey Gallows. So, again, shout out to the Grey King. Um, he's on the Gallows, so that's... Basically, it's, it's right next... So, the boom across the river and then the Grey Gallows are mentioned one after another. So, it's just like, look at these cool weirwood symbols that are right next to River Run, which is a weirwood symbol. We've got the weir boom, you've got the Gallows Tree, and you've got the castle itself, which regulates the River of Time. So, they're all together. And then, Edmure stands there day after day with the noose around his neck. So, it's like... He's eternally there now, just like a green seer who is entering eternity in the weirwood net. And just like, um, again, Odin hung on Yggdrasil for nine days and nights to, to do this act of transcendence. So here is Edmure, day after day, night after night, hung on this gallows tree. Pretty cool. Let's see here. And then they talk about Jamie being a green squire when he first saw River Run. And then Lord Hoster kept him here a fortnight trying to matchmake with him and Lysa. And then uh, Davin says, small wonder you took the white. So fortnight, that's night fort clue. Jamie was there, you know, at the at this symbolic night fort. And who is he, who is Hoster trying to match him with? Lysa, who's a Knight's Queen character. So just a little shout out to Lysa's Knight's Queenness with that last passage. So continuing on with Jamie, Hang Edmure Tully for a start, and this is at their, their war meeting, urged Lord Emmon Frey. That will teach Sir Brynden that we mean what we say. If we send Sir Edmure's head to his uncle, it may move him to yield. Brynden Blackfish has not moved so easily. Carl Vance, the Lord of Wayfarer's Rest, had a melancholy look. A wine-stained birthmark covered half his neck and one side of his face. All right. So the Lord of Wayfarer's Rest. Oh, he's got a wine-stained birthmark on his face. That's just like Blood Raven. Let's check out the sigil of... House Vance of Wayfarer's Rest. Oh my god, it's a dragon. <laughs> it's a black dragon. Um, and uh, some eyes in the darkness. <laughs> so, interesting. Yes, interesting. So basically, a symbolic representative of Blood Raven is like, oh, the blackfish, he's not moved so easily. You know, you can hang people, but it's not going to move him. The weirwoods don't move either. And, uh, yeah. So, that's pretty fun. Yeah, no, it's actually it's called a dragon. Varl Vance. <laughs> and so, later in the meeting, it says, Storming the walls will be a bloody business, said Adam Marbrand. I propose we wait for a moonless night, and then send a dozen picked men across the river in a boat with muffled oars. They can scale the walls with ropes and grapnels and open the gates from the inside. I will lead them if the council wishes. So that's a last hero mission there. 
Adam Marbrand, House Marbrand sigil is a burning tree. So that's a weirwood symbol. Adam is the name of Adam is in Adam and Eve. So he represents archetypal man. Marbrand is carrying a fiery brand. He's a burning tree man. And he wants to wait for a moonless night. Again, the long night is when the moon fell out of the sky. Then cross the river, i.e. cross over into the lands of the dead. And we're going to open the gates from the inside. So opening some weirwood gates from the inside, perhaps. So it's definitely a total last hero mission that we just dropped in there. And this is something that they're going to do to River Run. And taking the castle of River Run is equivalent to taking the Weirwood Net. So that just tells you the last hero, whatever he did, he went into the Weirwood Net. And, you know, that story about Bran the Builder learning the secret language of the children of the forest, that might be part of this. And we definitely think that Bran and Daenerys and Jon are going to have to go north into the heart of winter and do something that's going to affect the Weirwood Net. So this, this Weirwood Net mission here from Adam Marbrand is pretty cool. So now, let's read a tiny bit of this chapter. This is Feast. The gallows had been raised ten feet off the ground. Two spearmen were posted at the foot of the steps. You can't go up without Sir Ryman's leave, one told Jamie. This says I can. Jamie tapped his sword hilt with a finger. The question is, will I need to step over your corpse? The spearmen moved aside. Atop the gallows, the Lord of Riverrun stood staring at the trap beneath him. What have we said about the Weirwood Net? It's a trap, right? It traps. Blood Raven is physically trapped. And his spirit resides in the Weirwood Net when he dies. So, on the gallows, the Lord of River Run, staring at the trap beneath him. That's, <laughs> that's pretty sweet. Also, Odin falls from Yggdrasil to seize up the runes. So, he's staring down and thinking about falling. His feet were black and caked with mud, his legs bare. Edmure wore a soiled silken tunic striped in tully red and blue, a noose of hemp and rope. At the sound of Jamie's footsteps, he raised his head and licked his dry, cracked lips. Kingslayer. The sight of Sir Illyn widened his eyes. Better a sword than a rope. Do it, Payne. Sir Illyn, said Jamie. You heard Lord Tully. Do it. The silent knight gripped the silent night gripped his great sword with both hands silent night illy in pain long and heavy it was sharp as common steel could be edmure's cracked lips moved soundlessly as sir ellen as sir Ilian drew the blade back he closed his eyes the stroke had all of pain's weight behind it no stop no edwin frey came panting into view my father comes, fast as he can. Jamie, you must. My lord would suit me better, Frey, said Jamie. And you would do well to omit must from any speech directed at me. Sir Ryman came stomping up the gallows steps in company with a straw-haired slattern as drunk as he was. <clears throat> I didn't skip a sentence, did I? No, they didn't give it away yet. Yeah, this is all written in suspense. You don't know what's happened to Edmure. Just that Ilan Payne has swung his sword. Sir Ryman came stomping up the gallows steps in company with a straw-haired slattern as drunk as he was. Her gown laced up the front, but someone had undone the laces to the navel, so her breasts were spilling out. They were large and heavy with big brown nipples. On her head, a circle of hammered bronze sat askew, graven with runes, and ringed with small black swords. So I will just say real quick, the, the, the symbolism of overflowing breast milk and fertility, that is, those are the rivers of Mother Earth. Like if Mother Earth is a river, those are the rivers. Or if Mother Earth is the earth, those are what the rivers are. So that is why we see this symbolism of the breast spilling out, 
uh, and all that stuff here. And there was um, there was something about breast milk in a previous quote that we read earlier. I forget what it was, but that was I forgot to point it out. That's that's river symbolism as well. So let's see here. And then she's got she's got the King of Winter crown that's eventually going to end up in the hands of Catelyn down in the cave. So let's see here. Graven with runes, ringed with small black swords. When she saw Jamie, she laughed. Who in seven hells is this one? The Lord Commander of the King's Guard, Jamie returned with a cold courtesy. I might ask the same of you, my lady. Lady? I'm no lady. I'm the queen. Remember, she's drunk. My sister will be surprised to hear that. Lord Ryman crowned me his very self. She gave a shake of her ample hips. I'm the queen of whores. No, Jamie thought. My sweet sister holds that title too. <laughs> Even Jamie's inner monologue. Sir Ryman found his tongue. Shut your mouth, slut. Lord Jamie doesn't want to hear some harlot's nonsense. This Frey was a thick-set man with a broad face, small eyes, and a soft, fleshy set of chins. His breath stank of wine and onions. Making queens, Sir Ryman, Jamie asked softly. Stupid. As stupid as this business with Lord Edmure. I gave the Blackfish warning. I told him Edmure would die unless the castle yielded. I had this gallows built to show them that Ryman Frey does not make idle threats. At Seaguard, my son Walder did the same with Patrick Malister and Lord Jason bent the knee, but the Blackfish is a cold man. He refused us, so... You hanged Lord Edmure? The man reddened. My Lord Grandfather, if, if we hang the man, we have no hostage, sir. Have you considered that? Only a fool makes threats he's not prepared to carry out. If I were to threaten to hit you unless you shut your mouth, and you presume to speak, what do you think I'd do? Sir, you do not under... Jamie hit him. It was a backhand blow delivered with his golden hand, but the force of it sent Sir Ryman stumbling backward into the arms of his whore. You have a fat head, Sir Ryman, and a thick neck as well. Sir Illyn, how many strokes would it take you to cut through that neck? Sir Illyn laid a single finger against his nose. Jamie laughed. An empty boast. I say three. Ryman Frey went to his knees. I have done nothing but drink and whore. Yes, I know. I'm heir to the crossing. You can't. I warned you about talking. Jamie watched the man turn white. A sot, a fool, and a craven. Lord Walder had best outlive this one, or the phrase are done. You are dismissed, sir. Dismissed? You heard me. Go away. But where should I go? To hell or home, as you prefer. See that you are not in camp when the sun comes up. You may take your queen of horse, but not that crown of hers. Jamie turned from Sir Ryman to his son. Edwin, I am giving you your father's command. Try not to be so stupid as your sire. <clears throat> that ought not pose much difficulty, my lord. Send lord to... <laughs> so you can see... This guy's son is more than happy to step up and be like, Yep, don't worry about that. <laughs> I've been waiting for this promotion. We can see how the phrase are. Send word to Lord Walder. The crown requires all his prisoners. Jamie waved his golden hand. Sir Lyle, bring him. Edmure Tully had collapsed face down on the scaffold when Sir Ilian's blade sheared the rope in two. So the first time you read the book, you've just thought that Edmure might be dead that whole time. It's just kind of funny. He'd collapsed face down on the scaffold. Uh, a foot of hemp rope still dangled from the noose about his neck. Strong Boar grabbed the end of it and pulled him to his feet. A fish on a leash, he said, chortling. There's a sight I've never seen before. The phrase stepped aside to let them pass. A crowd gathered below the scaffold, including a dozen camp followers in various states of disarray. Jamie noticed one man holding a wood harp. You, singer, come with me. The man doffed his hat, as my lord commands. <clears throat> No one said a word as they walked back to the ferry, with Sir Ryman Singer trailing after them, but as they shoved off from the riverbank and made for the south side of the Tumblestone, Edmure Tully grabbed Jamie by the arm. Why? A Lannister pays his debts, he thought, and you're the only coin that's left to me. Consider it a wedding gift. 
Okay, so let me see here. So he, this is Jamie's plot is it works. He's basically telling Edmure that he's going to hand him back to River Run. And that's going to put him in charge and not the Blackfish. And he knows that he can threaten this guy and not the Blackfish. So it's a pretty smart ploy by Jamie. It's a little off topic, but just like that there. And of course, he threatens Edmure by sending his, you know, his child back to him with a trebuchet. Which is fun. Um... Oh, this is kind of interesting. You've seen our numbers, Edmure. You've seen the ladders, the towers, the trebuchets, the rams. If I speak the command, my cuz will bring your moat, will bridge your moat and break your gate. Hundreds will die, and most of them your own. Your former bannermen will make up the first wave of attackers, so you'll start the day by killing the fathers and brothers of men who died for you with the twins. The second wave will be the phrase. I've no lack of those. My western men will follow when your archers are short of arrows and your knights are so weary they can hardly lift their blades. When the castle falls, all those inside will be put to the sword. Your herds will be butchered. Your god's wood will be felled. Your keeps and towers will burn. I'll pull your walls down and divert the tumble stone over the ruins. By the time I'm done, no man will ever know that a castle once stood here. Jamie got to his feet. Your wife may well before that. You'll want your child, I expect. I'll send him to you when he's born. With a trebuchet. So there's that. <clears throat> um, <laughs> interesting, when we're thinking back to the whole idea of where did House Fisher come from? Where's the Misty Isle? We can't find it. Well, this is interesting. The threat here is to pull down the castle, divert the tumblestone over the ruins, and basically erase the island <laughs> from existing. So did they come from an island that disappeared or is mysteriously vanished? Maybe. All right, so let's see here. Oh yeah, so there's one, one last little bit to this. The Inn at the Crossroads is strongly tied to House Tully, and Catelyn talks about it a lot. Um, it's run by Masha Heddle, who foreshadows Cat. Masha Heddle chews sour leaf and has a red mouth all the time. Then she ends up getting hung on the tree outside of her inn, because horrible things happen in the Riverlands. And so she's, yeah, they call it the Gallows Inn. So she's on a gallows tree. She's, you know, hung and also with the weirwood stigmata. So the thing about the inn is the inn itself is a weir. So in those days, the trident flowed beneath its back door and half its rooms were built out over the water. Guests could throw a line out of their windows and catch trout, it said. There was a ferry landing here as well, so travelers could cross to Lord Haraway's town and White Walls. So the river has moved course, and it no longer flows beneath the back door of the Inn of the Crossroads, which used to be called the River Inn. But it used to be that, um, yeah, the rooms were built out over the water, just like a weir. People could fish from it, and they could try to catch trout. So just like the weir... At River Run, the boom is meant to catch Tully Trout. This end that Catlin is linked to is meant to catch regular trout. All right, so now let's read Blackfish's Escape. And this might be the last thing that we do today, I think. Because we're, what are we? Almost three hours here. The rest of it would be uh, Stoneheart and Lysa stuff. Oh, whoops, I hit the wrong button. Um, which book do we want? I think this is Feast. Yes, right here. The new lord of River Run was so angry that he was shaking. We've been deceived, he said. This man has played us false. 
Pink spittle flew from his lips as he jabbed a finger at Edmure Tully. I will have his head off. I rule in River Run by the king's own decree. I... Emmon, said his wife. The Lord Commander knows about the king's decree. Sir Edmure knows about the king's decree. The stable boys know about the king's decree. I am the Lord and I will have his head. For what crime? Thin as he was, Edmure still looked more lordly than Emmon Frey. He wore a quilted doublet of red wool with a leaping trout embroidered on his chest. His boots were black, his breeches blue. His auburn hair had been washed and barbered, his red beard neatly trimmed. I did all that was asked of me. And this is after they've surrendered the castle, obviously. And Blackfish has escaped. Oh? Jamie Lannister had not slept since River Run had opened its gates and his head was pounding. I do not recall asking you to let Sir Brynden escape. You required me to surrender my castle, not my uncle. Am I to blame if your men let him slip through their siege lines? Jamie was not amused. Where is he? He said, letting his irritation show. His men had searched River Run thrice over, and Brendan Tully was nowhere to be found. He never told me where he meant to go. And you never asked. How did he get out? Fish swim, even black ones. Edmure smiled. Jamie was sorely tempted to crack him across the mouth with his golden hand. A few missing teeth would put an end to his smiles. For a man who was going to spend the rest of his life as a prisoner, Edmure was entirely too pleased with himself. So again, this is more green seer stuff, right? <clears throat> Hung on the gallows, cut down from the tree, fell like Odin. Now he's going to spend the rest of his life a prisoner. It's just like Bran or Bloodraven. Edmure, too pleased with himself. We have oubliettes beneath Casterly Rock that fit a man as tight as a suit of armor. You can't turn in them, or sit, or reach down to your feet when the rats start gnawing at your toes. Would you care to reconsider that answer? Lord Edmure's smile went away. You gave me your word that I would be treated honorably as befits my rank. So you shall, said Jamie. Nobler knights than you have died whimpering in those oubliettes, and many a high lord too. Even a king or two, if I recall my history. Your wife can have the one beside you, if you like. I would not want to part you. Thanks, Martin Krog. I should check on my email, too. <clears throat> so, after this threat, <laughs> he did swim, said Edmure, sullenly. He had the same blue eyes as his sister, Catelyn, and Jamie saw the same loathing there he'd once seen in hers. We raised the portcullis on the water gate. Not all the way, just three feet or so. Enough to leave a gap under the water though the gate still appeared to be closed. My uncle is a strong swimmer. After dark, he pulled himself beneath the spikes. And he slipped under our boom the same way, no doubt. A moonless night, board guards, a blackfish and a black river floating quietly downstream. If Rudiger or you or any of their men heard a splash, they would put it down to a turtle or a trout. Edmure said, so, okay. So a trout is what Edmure is, a turtle is the old man of the river. That's the god of the river. It's pretty cool. Edmure had waited most of the day before hauling down the direwolf of Stark in token of surrender. In the confusion of the castle changing hands, it had been the next morning before Jamie had been informed that the blackfish was not among the prisoners. He went to the window and gazed out over the river. It was a bright autumn day and the sun was shining on the waters. By now, the blackfish could be ten leagues downstream. You have to find him insisted Emmon Frey. He'll be found, Jamie spoke with a certainty he did not feel. I have hounds and hunters sniffing after him even now. Sir Adam Marbrand was leading the search on the south side of the river, Sir Dermot of the Rainwood on the north. He had considered enlisting the river lords as well, but Vance and Piper and their ilk were more like to help the blackfish escape than clap him into fetters. All in all, he was not hopeful. So, I think that's what I wanted to read there. Let's see. Yeah. Oh no, there's a little more with Edmure, I think. Um. This was my father's solar, solar said Tully. He ruled the Riverlands from here wisely and well. He liked to sit beside that window. The light was good there, and whenever he looked up from his work, he could see the river. 
When his eyes were tired, he would have Cat read to him. Littlefinger and I built a castle out of wooden blocks once, there beside the door. You will never know how sick it makes me to see you in this room, Kingslayer. You will never know how much I despise you. <clears throat> pretty good, pretty good quote there. And then just more about Hoster watching the river. We've already talked about that. So there you go. Um, oh yeah, the, let me give you this description of Blackfish. So we just said all this about the gate, right? He swam under the gate. He swam under the boom. What does that mean? Okay, so we saw Adam Marbrand talking about leading a mission into River Run, you know, by crossing the river and all this stuff. Well, Blackfish, as somebody who can go in and out of the weirwood net who can escape from the weirwood net like that is a last hero figure and again the obsidian fish gives him obvious night's watch symbolism and then the clincher is that he is the knight of the bloody gate so the bloody gate is another way of talking about the weirwood mouth it's a bloody mouth the mouth can literally be a gate it's in the black gate that Bran walks through <clears throat> and it's Blackfish that guards the gate, the castle that strides the, the gate. So just like the Night's Watch guard the night fort and the wall. It's very, very good parallel. So when she saw the battlements ahead, and this is Catelyn walking up to the bloody gate, <clears throat> long parapets built into the very stone of the mountains on either side of them, where the pass shrank to a narrow defile scarce wide enough for four men to ride abreast, Twin watchtowers clung to the rocky slopes, joined by a covered bridge of weathered gray stone that arched above the road. So that's a symbol of the Weirwood Net. There's twin watchtowers. There's one on either side. The bridge is like the wall. It's the, it's the in-between. It's the bifurcation. And gray stone. So think of petrified Weirwood. Think of the Gray King. And it's a bridge. So it's a crossing point. Silent, and that's what this place is, the Bloody Gate. It is the crossing point. It's what it represents. Um, and the phrase, the same thing. Two towers and a bridge, river crossing, all the same symbolism. Just duplicated. Um, silent faces washed from arrow slits and towers, battlements, and bridge. When they had climbed almost to the top, a knight rode out to meet them. His horse and armor were gray. Shout out to the Gray King. But his cloak was rippling the red and blue of River Run, and a shiny... Black fish, wrought in gold and obsidian, pinned its folds against his shoulder. Who would pass the bloody gate, he called. Sir Donald Wayne would. Okay, so Donald is, means thunder, like Dondarian. And like Donner, the reindeer. And Wayne would, of course, is that wheel that we were talking about. The wheel of the seasons that has to do with the cycles of time and River Run's water wheel tower and all that stuff. So Donald Wayne Wood and Lady Catelyn Stark are here to pass the bloody gate. Pretty good stuff. The knight of the gate lifted his visor. I thought the lady looked familiar. You are far from home, little cat. And you, uncle, she said, smiling despite all she'd been through. Hearing that hoarse, smoky voice again took her back 20 years to the days of her childhood. My home is at my back, he said gruffly. Your home is in my heart, Catelyn took, told him. Take off your helm. I would look on your face again. So Catelyn, as a weirward goddess, represents the heart tree. So Brendan, yeah, where is his home? In the heart tree. That's what the castle represents. <clears throat> the years have not improved it, I fear, Brendan Tully said, but when he lifted off the helm, Catelyn saw that he lied. His features were lined and weathered, and time had stolen the auburn from his hair and left him only gray. But the smile was the same, and the bushy eyebrows fat as caterpillars, and the laughter in his deep blue eyes. So let me see if there's more descriptions of him. He had always known how to listen. He was Lord Hoster's brother, younger by five years, but the two of them had been at war as far back as Catelyn could remember. So there's the fighting brothers motif from Finnegan's Wake and lots of mythology. During one of their louder quarrels when Catelyn was eight, Lord Hoster had called Brynden the Black Goat of the Tully Flock. Laughing, Brynden had pointed out their sigil of the house was a leaping trout, so he ought to be the Black Fish rather than a Black Goat. And from that day, he had taken it as his personal emblem. 
So that's cool. Got some black goat uh, symbolism for last hero, black fish. That goes with his obsidian fish. And he's good at listening. <clears throat> he's inside the weird net. All right. Oh, the Viking funeral. I guess we do got to read that, of course. This will be the last one. Mm, yeah, this is going to be in Storm. This would be a good way to finish. A blackfish the size of a trout would be the exact size and shape and color of an obsidian dagger or a glass candle. Yeah, trout can be kind of big, right? Oh. 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 Mm. All right. One last musical break, and then we'll read this scene. Do, we'll do uh, the quick... We'll do mythical astronomy, but I'll cut it short. Let's, uh, let me go back to the, oh, let's do a little art real quick. <clears throat> I got a couple blackfish. Uh, this is Antonio Manzanato. There's old blackfish with his silver fish armor and his obsidian fish there on the brooch. Here's a good blackfish. Brendan Tully doesn't have his brooch. It's under the armor, guys. Don't want to get it damaged. There he is, though. You can see the fish man thing happening, for sure. This is uh, Miguel Regadon Harkness. This is mostly Stark heroes, but uh, the blackfish is here, right behind the wolf. You can see the Tully sigil. Blackfish Tully, he's a Stark hero for all of his work in the war as Rob's right-hand man. Oh, and that art is by... Um, Stefan Kopinski, as is this. This is Tully Knights. So you can see the colors. Oops, sorry. Splashing in the river. That's cool. Uh, this is River Run from Final Fantasy Games. Or what is it? Uh, Fantasy Flight Gaming? Sorry. Fa Final Fantasy is something different. Yeah, that sounded wrong when I said it. I was like, wait a minute. <clears throat> cool, yeah, I'll leave this here. So let the kings of winter have their cold crypts under the earth. Oh, no. What am I doing? I'm going to put this back up because it's funeral time. There we go. Let the kings of winter have their cold crypts under the earth, Catelyn thought. The Tullys drew their strength from the river, and it was to the river they returned when their lives had run their course. They laid Lord Hoster in a slender wooden boat, clad in shining silver armor, plate, and mail. His cloak was spread beneath him, rippling blue and red. His surcoat was divided red and blue as well. A trout, scaled in silver and bronze, crowned the crest of his great home they placed beside his head. On his chest they placed a painted wooden sword, his fingers curled about its hilt. That's, that's a tree, a tree man symbol. It's also eco-friendly. You don't, you know, don't need metal down in the river. So let's see here. Uh, male gauntlets hid his wasted hands. Oh, so much for that. Uh, and made him look almost strong again. His massive oak and iron shield was set by his left side, his hunting horn to his right. The rest of the boat was filled with driftwood and kindling and scraps of parchment and stones to make it heavy in the water. 
His banner flew from the prow, the leaping trout of River Run. Interesting, the use of driftwood. That actually really stands out. Um, that they're using driftwood in this Viking funeral here. That really makes you think of the Ironborn. Let's see. His banner flew from the prow, the leaping trout of River Run. Seven were chosen to push the funeral boat into the water in honor of the seven faces of God. Rob was one, Lord Hoster's liege lord. With him were Lords Bracken, Blackwood, Vance, Malister, Sir Mark Piper, and lame Lothar Frey, who had come down from the twins with the answer they had awaited. Forty soldiers rode in his escort, commanded by Walder Rivers, the eldest of Lord Walder's bastard brood, a stern, gray-haired man with a formidable reputation as a warrior. And they've already planned the Red Wedding at this point. So it's pretty sick to help out with the funeral. Their arrival, coming within the hours of Lord Hoster's passing, had sent Edmure into a rage. Walder Frey should be flayed and quartered, he'd shouted. He sends a cripple and a bastard to treat with us. Tell me there is no insult me meant by that. I have no doubt that Lord Walder chose his envoys with care, she replied. It was a peevish thing to do, a petty sort of revenge. But remember who we are dealing with. The late Lord Frey, father used to call him. The man is ill-tempered, envious, and above all, prideful. Blessedly, her son had shown better sense than her brother. Rob had greeted the phrase with every courtesy, found Beric's space for the escort, and quietly asked Sir Desmond Grell to stand aside so Lothar might have the honor of helping to send Lord Hoster on his last voyage. That sucks. Desmond Grell has been the castellan there forever. And he had to stand aside for this weasel fray traitor. Ugh. Gross. Lame Lothar, he planned the worst parts of the Red Wedding. Him and Black Walder. These are two of the architects. Ugh, disgusting. House Frey might have abandoned the King of the North, but the Lord of the Crossing remained the most powerful, the Riverman's bannerman, and Lothar was here in his stead. The Seven launched Lord Hoster from the water stair, wading down the steps as the portcullis was winched upward. Lothar Frey, soft-bodied, portly man, was breathing heavily as they shoved the boat out into the current. Jason Malister and Titus Blackwood at the prow stood chest-deep in the river to guide it on its way. Catelyn watched from the battlements. And that's interesting. Malister is the eagle. Of course, the eagle lives at the top of Yggdrasil. So you've got a tree man and an eagle man. Uh, Catelyn watched from the battlements, waiting and watching as she had waited and watched so many times before. Beneath her, the swift, wild tumblestone plunged like a spear into the side of the broad red fork. It's a hello Jesus language here for Hoster's death, the spear into the side. It's blue-white current churning the muddy red-brown flow of the great river. A morning mist hung over the water, as thin as gossamer and the wisps of memory. Shout out! House Fisher and the Misty Isle, theory confirmed, there's mist in the chapter. Brandon Rickon will be waiting for him, Catelyn thought sadly, as once I used to wait. The slim boat drifted out from under the redstone arch of the water gate and picked up speed as it caught in the headlong rush of the tumblestone and pushed out into the tumult where the waters met. As the boat emerged from beneath the high sheltering walls of the castle... Its square sail filled with wind, and Catelyn saw sunlight flashing on her father's helm. Lord Hoster Tully's rudder held true, and he sailed serenely down the center of the channel into the rising sun. Now, her uncle urged. Beside him, her brother Edmure, Lord Edmure now in truth, and how long would it take to grow used to that, knocked an arrow to his bowstring. His squire held a brand to its point. Edmure waited until the flame caught, then lifted the great bow, drew the string to his ear, and let fly. With a deep thrum, the arrow sped upward. Catelyn followed its flight with eyes and heart, until it plunged into the water with a soft hiss, well astern of Lord Hoster's boat. Don't! <laughs> oh. Edmure cursed softly. The wind, he said, pulling a second arrow. Again. The brand kissed the oil-soaked rag, kissed by fire. Beneath the arrowhead, and the flames went licking up. Edmure lifted, pulled, and released. High and far the arrow flew. Too far. 
It vanished in the river a dozen yards beyond the boat, its fire winking out in an instant. A flush was creeping up Edmure's neck, red as his beard. Once more, he commanded, taking a third arrow from the quiver. He is as tight as his bowstring, Catelyn thought. <clears throat> Do Catelyn and Jamie have last hero and Nissa, Nissa parallels? Asks Des Cobra. He's trapped in the river run, in the weirwood net, and she releases him, thinking the man is her only hope, but it's a devil's bargain. So that is potentially interesting observation in a chapter we should read. That sounds to me like... Um, it could be like Night's Queen creating the others as a revenge weapon, or it could be Stoneheart resurrecting... Yeah, exactly, resurrecting the last hero. I'll have to read that. I'll have to read that and find out. I couldn't say off the top of my head, but the language in the chapter should, should tell us. She gets him drunk. Yeah, there's a lot going on. It's a great chapter to read, so I'll, I'll, I'll put that on the list for chapter reads. So Sir Brynden must have seen the same thing. Let me, my lord, he offered. I can do it, Edmure insisted. He let them light the arrow, jerked the bow up, took a deep breath, drew back the arrow. For a long moment, he seemed to hesitate while the fire crept up the shaft, crackling. Finally, he released. The arrow flashed up and up and finally curved down again, falling, falling, and hissing past the billowing sail. A narrow miss, no more than a hand span, and yet a miss. The others take it, her brother swore. Oh, God, no, no, not the others. The boat was almost out of range, drifting in and out among the river mists. Wordless, Edmure thrust the bow at his uncle. Swiftly, Sir Brendan said. He knocked an arrow, held it steady for the brand, drew and released before Catelyn was quite sure the fire had even caught. But as the shot rose, she saw the flames trailing through the air, a pale orange pennon. The boat had vanished in the mists. Falling, the flaming arrow was swallowed up as well, but only for a heartbeat. Then, sudden as hope, they saw the red bloom flower. The sails took fire, and the fog glowed pink and orange. For a moment, Catelyn saw the outline of the boat clearly, wreathed in leaping flames. Watch for me, little cat. He could hear him whisper. Catelyn reached out blindly, groping for her brother's hand, but Edmure had moved away to stand alone on the highest point of the battlements. Her uncle Brynden took her hand instead, twining his strong fingers through hers. Together they watched the little fire grow smaller as the burning boat receded in the distance. And then it was gone, drifting down river still, perhaps, or broken up and sinking. The weight of his armor would carry Lord Hoster down to rest in the soft mud of the riverbed, in the watery halls where the Tullys held eternal court, with schools of fish, their last attendants. So that is, again, not just the watery halls, but also schools of fish, their last attendants. That is just word for word, the same language as the ironborn beliefs about their watery halls, where they go when they die, where mermaids and fish are their serving men and crabs and things like that. And Patchface also describes the exact same thing. So this is why we started off talking about that theory. It's like these ancient beliefs of the Tullys that still exist, despite the fact that they adopted weirwood worship like all the other first men and then faith of the seven worship, they still have these aquatic beliefs that they practice here. So... Like I said, I think the best explanation is that they, the origins of their house and their beliefs come from a place by the sea, which would either be the Quiet Isle or some, some island that's disappeared now, possibly in Ironman's Bay. Um, if House Fisher is from the Isle of Faces, which is an interesting possibility, then it is less likely that they are connected to House Tully but perhaps there is some connection. Sorry to be stickler, but my name is pronounced and means crow, not croc. Oh, I would have said crog, but oh, it's crow. Yeah, I would not have known to pronounce K-R-O-G like crow. I definitely needed to be told that. So uh, thank you, Martin. You are a frequent supporter of the program. I am more than happy to say your name the right way. And plus, Martin Crow, that's a nice and fire name for show. 
<clears throat> oh, the blackfish goat, Capricorn. You're so right, Kirsty. Capricorn is a sea goat. You are totally right about that. Which brings us back to the Shield Islands and uh, Owen Oakenshield, who slew the Selkies. That's, that's the Capricorn-related myth. <clears throat> Very cool. So, not only the watery halls, but also this is a Viking funeral. Even though we don't see the Ironborn do funerals this way, the Ironborn are largely modeled off of Vikings, and this is... A Viking funeral. So I would say that all in all, it is a clue that culturally they are connected uh, somewhere in the distant, distant past. And House Fisher is my best theory about that. So it's been a fun stream. We did a little bit of everything. We went deep on a lot of stuff. Got Weirwood Net stuff. We did some Fishman stuff. Finnegan's Wake. We did some... I had to eat Krog on that one. Yeah, I did. <laughs> had to eat crow. I won't say crog. Hideous. Get it out of my ears. But yeah, that was good. That was a good... You can see the symbolism of the Tullys. It's not just like, oh, well, they're sigil. Like, no, it's, it's River Run. It's the cycles of time. It's all this commentary on... And, and this is maybe the important thing. Like, so... All this Weirwood Net stuff, like why is George so fascinated about writing about the cycles of time in the past? Because they're so emotional. Look at the way the characters are tied to their past and their memories and how much the past shapes their actions. Tyrion talking about everybody dancing on the puppet strings of their parents and stuff. So yeah, this idea of a green seer sitting there reviewing his life. I mean, it's very Finnegan's Wake. In the idea that, like, Finn is this hero, represents all of mankind or, you know, the capital city of Dublin, lying by the river and experiencing history in a dreamlike state. Like, that's the Green Seer's experience, kind of. So, very cool. Mike Boy says um, the Riverlands have at least as much Viking imagery as the Ironborn. What else is there, Mike Boy? Um, yeah, let me see. Yeah. Oh, your your PayPal came through as pending for some reason, Kelly. That's why it was in a separate category. I don't see the question. Just go ahead and ask it in the chat if you'd like to. I'm not sure why PayPal did that. It happens. Tobacco. Um, oh, sorry, I'm just reading the chat here. So there you go, questions? Anybody have any questions? It's all pretty clear as mud, right? <laughs> the wooden sword is a good symbol. We see the Starks wielding wooden swords a lot, and uh, that is just makes them tree knights, you know. So... Very cool, guys. Um, so I killed Quinn, and eventually Tim is going to have to kill you? No, no. Me and Quinn, you know, we split off before we killed each other. He has his own apprentice. So there's multiple Sith in the gal. We're bringing it back to the old days when there was more, more Sith. And just you guys are ruining the metaphor, okay? <laughs> River Mist Fay, let me see. Oh, so you did. So you did. Harkening back to Finnegan's Wake. I know the Tully symbol is a trout. However, the salmon of knowledge is a creature of Irish mythology, sometimes identified with the seer Fenton Mac Bokra, who was transformed into a salmon. He ate nine hazelnuts that fell into the well of wisdom. By this act, the salmon gained all the world's knowledge. Uh, that sounds like an echo of Odin for sure. Nine days and nights, Yggdrasil above a well, and he also drinks from the well of Mimir. The salmon gained all the world's knowledge and, oh, and, uh, right, Finn McCool eventually consumes the salmon and gains all that knowledge. That is very much like the meat of poetry, 
story. That reminds me a lot of that. Um, that is interesting. That is very interesting. The salmon of knowledge. He ate hazelnuts from the well of wisdom. Yeah, see, all these myths and the, uh, the meat of poetry, these are psychedelic rituals. Like nuts that fell into a well, like they're making various kinds of pastes and potions. And in the meat of poetry, there's, they're all spitting into like something. Yeah, there's, you know, those nuts are probably just mushrooms. That's kind of a separate topic. Anyway, very cool, River Mist. Appreciate that. So that's just another reason why you might see George looking at Finnegan's Wake and Finn McCool and uh, James Joyce's conception of Finn McCool as the memory of mankind or whatever. It's like, yeah, very inspiring for the Weirwood Net. Very cool. All right, guys. Uh, uh, thank you very much. It's been a fun stream. I was happy to concoct it for you and deliver it. And I will see you this week with an Ironborn video. That'll be the next thing you see for me is a produced video. It would be called The Grey King. No, it would be called The Secret Prehistory of the Ironborn, colon, The Grey King. There you go. Cheers, guys. And uh, thanks for everyone sending in PayPal's. I am going to buy a computer tomorrow. So if you're watching after the fact and you want to send them in, feel free. I need a nice computer. So. Cheers, guys, and I will see you again with an Ironborn video this week.